Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Julie Davenport. I'm the district forester for the Western Maine region. Um, I was excited to do this presentation because when I'm not working for the Forest Service, my husband and I have a small farm of our own. So um, I'll let my colleague Jim introduce himself. Hi everybody, I'm, I'm district forester Jim Ferrante. Um, I work out of the Greenville office, uh, mostly Piscataquis County. I, I agree with what, what Julie just said. Uh, my wife and I have a small Christmas tree farm in Sebec, so um, she's going to be doing the beginning of the presentation, so I'll hand things back to her. Great. Uh, let's get started. So beyond the field edge, um, this is a really brief introduction kind of on what to do with some of the forests that may be on your farm property. So next slide, please. So we'll start off with a little bit of history. Uh, Maine is a lot more forested now than it ever used to be. It probably peaked as being the least forested around 1872 when there was a lot of farming land. Everybody kind of had their own farm. And farming itself actually peaked in Maine around 1930. Um, next. OK, uh, currently in the state, there is a lot more woods than there used to be. So Maine is actually almost 90% forested now with only about less than 4% being farms. And the farm properties that are in the state are for the most part actually tend to be 50 to 60% forested themselves as well. Next slide. So let's think about a little bit about what you have on your own property. Um, have you got big forested chunks or do you maybe have just a row of big gnarly maple trees that drop leaves in your hay field in between two fields. Um, whatever you've got, there's a lot of different options you can do with it. So we can think about that moving forward. Next slide. So if you do have pieces of forest land, are they maybe um, areas that would be better off growing field that are currently trees and you'd like to cut them, maybe you wanna grow crops there or or maybe there's an old field that you're not haying anymore and you just assume let it grow up into trees. Um, maybe you want to do a combination of both. That would be agroforestry and we'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. Next. So some things to think about. Um, there's a lot of different activities that you could do. You could plant, you could thin out some stands to promote certain trees. Maybe you wanna sell some wood on the stump or stumpage to help pay the taxes. Um, working on your boundary lines is a great option too. There's all kinds of different activities that you can apply to your actual property where you have the trees growing. Um, next, some things to think about with that. Is that something you're even interested in? Uh, is it something you could do yourself or would you wanna hire it out? Is there time to do it maybe in the winter when things aren't as busy? Um, do you have equipment already that you could use for that? Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to the whole thing, but it, maybe it's a good fit and maybe it's not. Next. So a lot of things can come out of the woods, not only products from trees like lumber or plywood, firewood, but also some of the non-timber products like maple syrup, um, selling wreaths, selling and making wreaths, or even just the brush in the winter time is always a good option. Something to help kind of offset income in the winter. Um, Again, selling it on the stump as stumpage, that's always an option. Um, so lots of different things, but also, next slide, please. Um, there's also some non-monetary returns that you could get from a piece of land as well. Anyone who hunts is happy to have a place to do it. Uh, it's even nicer when you can do it on your own property. Maybe there's particular animals and, that you'd like to promote such as um, deer, again, if you're hunting, or certain songbirds that maybe are threatened and you want to encourage them. And maybe you just like to have a nice, quiet place to go and get away from things, and that can be on your own property. A lot of people have some really nice trails that they can walk on right out back. Um, so that's something to consider, too, when you're trying to decide what it is that you want to get out of your land. Next. So a little bit, again, deep, digging deeper into habitat. Um, there's a lot of things you can do when you're managing a forest to promote a certain species, but you can also try to deter a certain species. So for an example of when you might want to try to manage something to 
to um, encourage an animal not to be there is if, um, for instance, you had a sheep pasture and it, there was some woods right next to it and you were having an issue with some coyotes. There are certain things that you can do in the management of those forests to try to help deter having the animals from coming in and, and getting into your pasture. Um, next. So we'll talk a little bit about planning because that's kind of where it, what it all comes down to. Um, we've talked a little bit about what things you might want to do um, and having a plan is a good way to actually get there. So I think we all have had things that we've wanted to do that we didn't have a plan for and then lo and behold, they never happened. So um, uh, one of the big takeaways from this presentation is just where you can get a lot of help for those types of things. It's available federally through the NRCS program. Uh, there's a lot of help available from the state, from us. Um, we as district foresters are available as a resource almost any time for whatever you may be needing or wondering about. Um, and there's also a lot of private forestry consultants working in the state who would be available to be hired and help you prepare a plan for your property or help oversee a timber harvest or anything. So um, next. So what is a forest management plan? Um, overall, it's a written document that's unique to your property. Typically, you can think of it as a tool um, or kind of a guide in the timing of the activities that you'd like to do to help achieve what it is that you're looking to accomplish. Um, so next, please. Um, so what's in a forest management plan? I like to say that it's the basic, what, if you boil down a forest management plan, what it comes down to is, what you've got, what you want to have, and how to get there. So we're going to dig in a little bit deeper to this as we go through. But first of all, you're going to describe what's already there, outline what it is you'd like to do, and then recommendations on what to do and when in order to do it. And then some of the other things along the way that may either help you or hurt you, such as insects and disease that may be prevalent in your forest or maybe a risk for your forest. Um, and again, those all those non-timber things such as wildlife management, all of that's gonna be in your forest management plan as well. Next. So what are the key things that you should know about your property? First of all, you ought to know where it is. Because <laughs> um, if you don't know where it is, you don't have much of a place to start. But knowing what's in it is also important. So that would be your inventory. Um, some foresters will go ahead and do an actual inventory where they'll tally the trees, usually not every tree, but you'll get some real good mathematical representation of what's there, or depending on what you're interested in, there's plans where um, it's more of just a verbal description of what's there. But um, then moving on from that, you'll also talk about the silviculture, which is, we'll talk more about what silviculture is specifically, but that's kind of the how-to of getting from the trees you have to the trees you want. And again, the actions and choices. So when and what to do or what not to do in order to help achieve those goals that you outlined from the beginning. Next. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, first, we talked about where your woods are. Um, if good fences make good neighbors, good property lines make even better neighbors. Um, if there was a single takeaway that you could take from this, one of them would be, I would hope that uh, maintaining your property lines and knowing where they are is super important. So if, if you don't even know where to start, a great place to look is in your deed. Um, that will help you at least figure out what you're looking for on the ground. Um, Cause a lot of times the deeds will reference if uh, your property line is a stone wall or it's old barbed wire that runs through the woods or maybe it's blazed trees. Um, and you never know what you're gonna find in a deed, especially in Maine, They're, a lot of them are pretty old. I actually found a deed once that referenced the hole in the ice. Which I wasn't super encouraged by that, but sure enough, it was there. Um, it was a spring underground there, but anyway, moving on. Um, so that is a great place to start. Again, deeds. Um, next slide, please. So maintaining your property lines is really helpful. Um, it's incredible how quickly the evidence will disappear. Sorry, that's my daughter in the background. I don't know if you can hear that. But um, anyway, the steps that I would recommend, um, you can find more information in this info sheet number four. It's a really great publication that we put out. Um, it's available online or if you contact one of the district foresters, we'd be happy to get it to you. But um, identifying the evidence that's already there is great. 
Um, if you can, get your neighbors to agree on it before you do any serious marking, but then you can go in and blaze and repaint trees. And there's a lot more information about that in the sheet on how to do it. Next. So what else is there? There's a lot more than trees that we need to consider. Um, soils are really important because they dictate what kind of trees will and can grow there. So we kind of figuratively start from the ground up, right? So we'll talk about soils um, in a management plan because it is so important. And then moving into things other non-timber things such as the water, do you have streams running through the property? How does that impact things? Will that have an impact on your planning? Um, will there be a bridge that needs to be put in for some kind of management activity? <laughs> and then, um, of course, any animals that may already be there, um, that's kind of important too. <laughs> you wanna know what you've got. So uh, different trees too, um, whatever species there are, will have an impact on wildlife. They'll have an impact on your financial return. So uh, just knowing what's there is really important. Um, next. So we've got a couple of different tools that I'm gonna talk about really quick. Um, like I have mentioned, starting with the soils. This is a great, this map here is a soil map of a property, but um, it was made with a tool called the Web Soil Survey. It's a free to use program um, put out by the USDA. You can find it at uh, websoilsurvey.com and you can actually draw the rough outline of your property on an aerial map and it'll you can hit run and it'll pull up your soil map for the property. So that can be a really great place to start. They also have a lot of applications specific to farming in that um, web program. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Thanks. Um, next, another great resource, probably my favorite, and not just because I work for the Forest Service, but because it really is that good, um, is the Forest Trees of Maine. It's a book that we put out. Um, you can buy it, but another even better way to get it is if you set up or schedule a uh, meeting or a walk and talk with one of us district foresters, we're happy to share it with you. It is a full color, um, in-depth guide on identifying the main trees. Um, you don't have a whole bunch of random ones that don't grow up here that get in the way when you're trying to ID what you actually have. And the, it was really well made. Um, the pictures are great and it's it's definitely the go-to for IDing any any trees. So that's another great tool to use. Next. All right, so we've talked about what we have and we already kind of know what we want because we've been thinking about our goals. So now how do we get from what we have to what we want? That's where silviculture comes in. So, so we like to think of silviculture as both the art and the science of managing forests to meet landowners and society's goals. So there's a lot to it, but if you really boil it down, um, one of the, th the, the three things that trees need are nutrients, water, and light. We can't really affect the nutrients and water available just because it's an issue of scale. It's not really something we can do, but light we can play with. So if you wanna kind of trim down what silviculture is as far as its actual practice, it's manipulating light to affect any number of the things on this list. So growth rates, um, that's like the how fast the trees are growing, what kind of trees, how good the trees are, um, what kind of trees you might want to regenerate, and also just the overall age and size class of the forest. So again, that's done by playing with light. Um, next. So that's for the most part, um, kind of sums up most of the stuff. We just have a quick couple slides on some of the agroforestry. And so that is the integration of the trees and the actual animal or crop farming. Um, it's starting to become a little bit more popular and there's a good reason for it. Um, one of the most common types of agroforestry that we're seeing popping up is um, silvopasture. And we've got a couple slides taking you through kind of the process of creating some silvopasture. So, next. So as you can see here, um, hopefully you can see it anyway, uh, we had, this was a property, I believe it was in Bodenham. It's out of my district. I wasn't involved, but um, I believe this obviously in the top left was the starting picture. So this was a full-fledged forest. Um, they chose the trees that they wanted to keep and cut the rest, did some mulching um, for site prep to get it all smooth and get the stumps out of there. Uh, next. 
And then they were actually able to plant it with some better quality forage. And then on the last picture there, you can see that they've got the goats in there. So uh, that can be a really great option. I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's a symbiotic relationship for pasturing animals under trees, but the trees certainly are an advantage for the animals. They offer shade, shelter, um, in some cases forage, but typically not. Usually shade, shelter, wind cover, those kinds of things. So that can be a really great option. And on that note, I think uh, we're going to hand it over to Jim and he's going to talk about kind of the next section of managing forest properties, which is timber harvesting. So uh, take it away, Jim. Hey, can every, um, let me know if you can't hear me. But uh, so when it comes to tim timber harvesting, you know, things that are really important to think about is the who, what, why, when, and how type type uh, things to think about, you know, who's going to be doing the harvesting. So is it is going to be you, the landowner? Are you going to hire a logger or possibly even get a consulting forester involved? Um, you know, I guess it's more important to know why are you harvesting? Are you harvesting for financial reasons? Do you have habitat goals? Do you need lumber for personal uses? Things like that are important to think about. Um, when? So um, market and weather conditions play a huge role when it comes to, um, you know, marketing the, the wood that you sell off your land. Um, obviously, like, you know, in the wet springtime, it doesn't really make sense to be entering the woods to, with big equipment to do harvesting because you're going to do tremendous damage to your soil. Um, and then obviously, you know, markets fluctuate with, you know, with the way the world works, it's it's always up and down. So those those are things um, to think about. And then the how are are is it is it uh, like I said, is it going to be a, a commercial operation with big machines? Do you have some draft animals yourself? You're going to pull the wood out or something else? Um, so those are some things to think about. So uh, next slide, next slide, please. Um, so here's here's some examples of of uh, silviculture. You can see in this. Um, or, or timber harvesting rather you can see in this left hand picture um a lot of residual um hardwoods that are left after after the harvest occurred um you can see a few stumps out there um you can see that the trees that are remaining are are good quality trees um you know they're going to continue to grow and, and increase in value um uh down low here on the right you can kind of see a good example of of uh this left hand smaller smaller uh cookie is from an unthinned stand so the growth rings are super tight um you know it's much smaller um size and then on on the right hand side you could see you know this this example of a tree that's been in a stand that's been thinned um much much bigger growth rings much much larger diameter tree um next slide please um so yeah um, this kind of goes back to Julie talking about planning. Um, you know, the more thought and time you put in to planning a harvest, you know, typically the better the results, you know, um, especially for a commercial harvest. Um, you know, those, they're big machines. They have a big impact. So having your skid trails and things like that laid out in a way that's um, the least impactful um, is, is very, very important. Um, and then knowing knowing which trees you're cutting is is very important so sometimes marking them makes sense but even more so knowing which trees you want to continue to grow and not damage during harvest is probably more important than knowing which trees you're going to cut so thinking about that ahead of a time is extremely important and then in terms of uh you know if you're getting a logger or, or a forester involved like ha having having all of your agreements and paperwork in order is 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 very important um you know like the benefit of having a consulting forester is that they're very um in tune with that they do it on a regular basis they know the ins and outs of the industry so it's something to think about and then also just being present whether it's you the landowner um you know you know what you know what you want so being involved in the process is is really important Next slide, please. So yeah, this is just some examples of uh, you can you know ways to utilize wood on your property. Um, 
you can see on this middle picture here they they have a little sawmill a little band sawmill on a trailer you can know you know maybe you have a barn that you need to repair or maybe you need to build a barn or any other structure on your property you know you might as well utilize the wood that you have growing it's it's a lot cheaper than uh purchasing it from home depot um you know you can see on the left left hand picture here you know all a bunch of firewood piled up here on the edge of a field you know a lot of a lot of farms have wood boilers and you know it's a great way to utilize your resource and um save yourself some money um next next slide please so here are some examples of uh different different wood products that um may or may not come from your property so you have you know your your higher value products um you know your saw logs and your veneer logs um so those typically are your you know like i said those are your highest value products they typically represent you know the lowest volume of products harvested just because you know trees that meet those specs are usually exceptional and then down low here you have your firewood and your mulch and chips those are typically you know your lower grade products um not that it's not important to harvest those things because cutting all of your good trees is, is inverse forestry. You want to remove a lot of your lower quality trees to make room for those good ones to grow. Next slide, please. And then here's some, you know, here's some examples of, of non timber products that you can, you can uh, produce from your pr property. Um, you have, you know, you have your classic kind of sugar bush management. Um, Here's a, here's the evaporator here in the sugar shack on the left hand side. Here's a here's a beautiful sugar bush here, all nice sugar maple. And then down low we have Christmas trees, which you know is you know if you're into crop farming, that's probably a lot easier kind of wrap, wrap your head around trees growing in rows. That's uh, a little bit more straightforward. Next slide, please. So here's kind of a, the suite of equipment that may or may not be utilized during harvest um you know you have your sort of your classic you know cable skater up in the upper right hand side um that you know for you know from the late early to late 60s on through the 90s and 2000s that was the you know standard of of logging everybody ran a cable skater and a chainsaw and that that's how it was done before that though you know in the middle here you see a guy with a little trailer and, and, a, and a horse that that's for before that that's how it happened um then you kind of have your in between up here on the upper left you know small farm tractor with a winch that's kind of your in between your horse and and your skitter and then down low here you know you have your suite of your it we call fully mechanized locking so you have your you have your harvesting equipment you have a chipper you have a uh, grapple skitter i think the next slide has a, a few more pictures on equipment if we could get to that so here, yeah, on the on the left hand side, we have our what we consider uh, modern mechanized felling equipment. Um, upper left would be a uh, machine that's designed to cut the trees into its desired products into the woods, right in the woods. So uh, cuts the tree off the stump. Um, you know, it, it then it and then it feeds feeds the tree through rollers on the on the end of that uh, boom there. And it cuts the tree into desired lengths and leaves it in a pile where this blue machine on the top right here, it's basically an off-road log truck, will come through and pick up those piles of, of product that have been uh, laid along the trail by the harvester. And then on the bottom here, we have your your uh, what we consider a whole tree system. So this machine cuts a tree at the stump. And lays the whole tree in, in a pile with with several other trees, branches, everything included. And then your this skitter on the lower right here, the grapple skitter, you notice how it's got a big kind of grabber on the back. We'll back up to those piles of wood, grab on them, bring everything out to the landing where everything is then merchandised into whatever whatever product it may be. And typically those systems chip the low grade material tops and, and non-merchantable things. So you end up with a uh, cleaner, you know, less, less slash debris after a harvest. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. 
So here's here's um, just a nice harvest map, um, kind of illustrating the type of planning and layout necessary to get a good results from a harvest. You can see, you know, um, sort of on the right side of the map, you can see there's a couple landing areas. So that's where all the wood coming out of the woods is then centralized before it's loaded onto trucks and, and goes down the road to wherever it's going to end up. You know, every, someone's taking time to lay out these main skid trails in the least impactful way. You can see that, you know, taking the time to find the best place to cross, whether it's wetlands or any other sensitive area, is, is really important. Um, just from a time and monetary standpoint, it's a lot easier to create a crossing over a narrow section of stream or wetland than it is to try and, you know, try and go through a big open bog or marsh. So thinking about these things ahead of time, it's not always the straight line, you know, A to B is the best way to go. Um, sometimes you have to, you know, put some turns and bends in your trails to uh, get the best results from a harvest. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned this before, you know, um, if, if you're not going to be doing all the work yourself, there are, you know, professionals that work in the woods, be it foresters as well as loggers. Um, you know, foresters bring a lot to the table in terms of value they have to landowners. Um, you know, it's their job to assess wood lots. You know, they, they write management plans on a regular basis. They oversee um, timber harvesting and, and other activities in the woods, road building and whatnot. Um, you know, they are required by the state of Maine to be licensed um, and they regularly have to continue their education. Um, you know, loggers there, you know, whereas a forester, you could um, like and compare them to some, I guess, an engineer or something like that. I mean, in terms of construction, um, you know, your loggers are your contractors, they're your, they're your carpenters, they're ele your electricians and whatnot. They're the ones that are actually out there in the woods getting stuff done you know they're they're cutting the trees they're they're yarding them up they're uh you know trucking the wood to m various markets um there are some there is some training and um you know certifications for for loggers there are not uh required by the state of maine to be certified or licensed or anything like that next slide please so here's um a picture of this is a publication put out by the Maine Forest Service, the Forestry Rules of Maine. Um, it's probably this. It's probably one of the more valuable publications that the state puts out because it's it's not necessarily the most interesting book to read, but in terms of of information to help you along the process of of harvesting and managing a woodlot, knowing what you can and can't do is very important. So, this is a book that you know whenever I whenever I meet with someone interested in, in doing some active management, I always try and give them this book because um, it's a great tool. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just some examples of um, some, some of the regulate laws and regulations um, that pertain more to farmland. So, you know, change of use. So to, to take a, a piece of property from forest and turn it into farmland or develop into anything else. There, there's a there's a process. You can't just cut all the trees down, and pull all the stumps, and and build a build a cow barn. There's a process. Um, I, I won't get, get too much into details, but um, there is a process. Next slide, please. So water quality is another, and it's paramount. You know, um, without clean water, um, you know, it makes it a lot of other things difficult. So. There are, you know, there's a, there's quite a few laws and regulations pertaining to protecting water quality, and um, that's what comes down to, you know, again, planning. Like I said, you know, thinking about what you're doing ahead of time makes makes things so much easier. Like I said, entering your woodlot in in uh, April to 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 do a bunch of harvesting is probably not gonna be good thing for your water quality. Next slide, please. So here's here's another publication um, that the state of Maine puts out. It's uh, best management practices. So th so things you can do to protect your water quality, like how to construct um, crossings on streams and in, in various wetlands, as well as um, you know cl 
closing out a harvest. So how to leave the land after you've done your harvesting in a way that's not going to cause erosion, like um, installing water bars on steep sections of skid trails is, is a good example of, of a best management practice. Next slide, please. So here's just a, a slide on um, just giving you some direction on uh, places you can go, depending on what questions you might have. Um, so, you know, the Maine Forest Service has all these publications that we just uh, talked about. Um, any district forester, myself and Julie included, we love to, to have one-on-one -on -one, um, interactions with landowners. So, you know, that's probably the most valuable thing that we can do for landowners is, you know, meet with you and walk your property and, you know, you can pick our brains and we can kind of get an idea of what you're trying to do and help you put you in the right direction. Um, so we do have some cost share programs like the Woodwise program. Um, it's it's a cost share program to help offset the costs of management planning that's administered through the state uh, via federal money. Um, there's also the Maine Woodlands Owner Association. They It's a third party organization that uh, does a lot of great things with woodland owners in Maine. And then um, the USDA NRCS um, they uh, allocate a lot of federal money for, for cost share um, practices, for management planning, crop tree release, invasive plant control, and things like that. Um, they're a really, really great resource. Um, it's a little bit more involved a process going through the NRCS just because it's a federal program. But uh, if you're a patient person, it's a, it's a really great way to, to uh, help offset the cost of doing some, some, uh, some management work. And then you have, like we said before, um, you know, private consulting foresters are a great resource, um, especially if you're act actively going to do any work. They're they're probably the, one of the better resources to work with. And then um, you have your main tree farm program, which is um, which is just a recognition or certification that you're managing your your land in the best way. Next slide, please. So here's just kind of a little bit breakdown of, of how the main forest service works. Um, we have 10 district foresters as well as all the staff in Augusta who, you know, entomology people. Um, we have uh, forest rangers, uh, you know, forest health specialists. So that's people who do entomology and pathology. And then we do um, landowner um, assistance. So some of the, the publications I talk about, presentations and workshops. And then, you know, all, all of all of the um, things we talked about in terms of uh, visiting with individual landowners. And then, you know, we do have a list of, of licensed foresters that we can provide, um, you know, depending on what area in, we can kind of narrow down the list for you to help help put you in contact with the, the person that's going to be best suited to help you with your with your unique needs. Next slide, please. So here's just a list of. Uh, different links um, that you might want to visit. Um, you know, you have the Forest Service Woodland Owners page, uh, local district forester. So we just, you can literally just type in what town you live in and we'll tell you which district forester is responsible for uh, your town. And then, um, we, like I said, we do have a list of uh, stewardship foresters that we can provide and then provide information on Woodswise Cost Share Program. And then I know it's probably tough for you guys to see, but uh, this map is up on our website. So we have 10 district foresters. Then we have three regional enforcement coordinators who oversee um, enforcement of, of, uh, of our water quality and timber harvesting laws. Um, the, the, map, the map does have a link in this session, so you can, you can uh, go, go directly to it from here. believe this is the last slide there might be one more yeah no that's that's it um any you know please if you have any questions please don't hesitate to ask jim do you want to take that one 
Sure, sure. Um, so, um, so in terms of uh, managing a, a stand towards maturity, um, so it's it's tough because forests operate on forest time, and uh, that's much different time scale than what people operate on. Um, so in terms of maturity, I guess it depends on you if you're, if you're just thinking about sort of your climax species or you know, are you talking about like big old trees? I guess that's probably a, a, a better way to propose a question. So the only, like Julie said before, the only thing we can really control in a forest is, is light. So if you're just looking to allow the forest to mature, that's something that's, that's going to have to happen with time. Um, in terms of getting that suite of climax species, you know, if it, if it, if it was a stand that was, uh, either farm or, or had a, a, a budworm outbreak, uh, chances are it's going to be an even age stand, um, of early successional species, probably birch and aspen, um, maybe some fir, um, it's going to take time to get those species like sugar maple and hemlock that are would be considered a mature stand. I hope that helped answer your question. So what happens when a district forester visits me and my woodlot? Um, well, it's kind of going to depend a little bit on your woodlot, but for the most part, uh, we're happy to schedule a meeting, come out. Uh, if there's certain things you'd like to look at or talk about, we'll make sure to hit those spots. Um, but we're happy to just kind of wander around with you too and figure out what you got and what, what help you flesh out some ideas of what you might like to do with it. And then um, any publications that might be useful or um, that might kind of go alongside with things we've talked about, we're happy to leave you with or hook you up with. And um, kind of one of our parting things a lot of times is we can try to set you up with a forester that we know works in the area that may be able to help you continue along the path that you, we've gotten you started on. So we can't actually oversee harvest or write plans for you or anything like that, but we can definitely help with questions. Um, and again, getting you set up with somebody who can start that long-term relationship for you and the management of your property. Yeah, can I, I'll just I'll just follow up on that, you know, in terms of, you know, creating a mature stand conditions, you know, having a forester write a management plan, you know, typically a 10 year plan will help kind of start to guide that forest towards the conditions you're looking for. So, yeah, um, there, you know, the the NRCS actually has a lot of great uh, cost share programs to help um control invasive plants um that would involve getting getting um consulting forester to uh apply for some cost share funding that would you know imply getting a management plan written and then and then applying for um invasive plant control uh practices but yes there is um julie might be able to tell speak more i know the state is going to begin rolling out a uh a program to help help landowners with invasive plants but it's i think it's still kind of in its infancy yeah sorry i was just trying to pull up some of the information on it so i could make sure i'm telling people the right thing um give me just a quick second so obviously some reasons why you might want to control invasive plants, if you're not familiar with them, is that they will, um, one of the biggest things that they'll do is they tend to outcompete our native trees and shrubs. Um, a lot of them, like for instance, they're adapted to leaf out before anything else in the spring. So that can really be a pain in the butt if you're trying to regenerate, say, pine or something, and your whole understory is covered in honeysuckle. Um, but there's a couple different things available to folks who are interested in more information on that. There's a main invasive plants field guide that's really good that can help you identify what, what invasives you may or may not have on your property and um, offer some ideas of how to work on controlling them. But there's also, um, there's lots of trained professionals available who um, can actually implement the invasive plant control, uh, pesticide applicators, whatever, 
the need be. Maybe it's something you can just hand pull yourself and maintain, or maybe it's something that you need to do a little bit more on. But uh, Jim's right. There is a program that's going to be rolled out sometime in the spring or summer of this year. Um, and unfortunately, Andy Schultz couldn't be with us today. Um, he had something come up, but I think he's right now. Oh, is he? Well, he's the probably the best contact there is on that whole thing. Uh, Speak of the devil. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I had some uh, personal issues that came up, so I wasn't able to be here at the top of the show, but I've been watching since about halfway through, and, and you guys have been doing a great job. Um, and I, I do want to add a little bit more about uh, what's going to be happening this spring with an invasive plant control program. Maine Forest Service is going to roll it out uh, with some help from a federal grant. Uh, the first phase of that will be um, a training program for foresters and other resource professionals. It's going to be called the Invasive Plant Academy, and it'll deal with identification and mapping of um, the invasive plant species. Also, um, learning different uh, a menu of treatment uh, procedures, and um, also some particulars for writing a certain kind of a plan. Uh, not really a management plan, but more of a practice plan that will be directed to, you know, invasive plant control. The second part of the program is going to be um, getting those plans written by the folks who graduate from the uh, Invasive Plant Academy. And that will give landowners sort of a blueprint for what they can do about the invasive plants in their woodlot. A lot of that has to do with things like integrated pest management, uh, prioritizing you know, what, what you can do, what you're able to do, and, and what's the most efficient way to deal with an infestation. And the third part of the program, which probably won't happen until 2022, uh, there is some money there to help treat um, infestations on lands. People, uh, woodlot owners, and by the way, this uh, program will also be open to land trusts and municipal lands, um, you know, town forests and, and things like that. But landowners with these invasive plant practice plans uh, will be eligible to apply for some treatment that will be um, handled by the Maine Forest Service through contractors. So that part will be a little different than what folks are used to uh, in a cost share program, but we hope that it will um, reach the goal of, of getting work done on the ground. But um, other than other than that, uh, so for that, just stay tuned. Um, for landowners out there, if you're working with a forester already, encourage your forester to sign up for that invas invasive plant academy because um, that, that'll be the key to having them write a plan for you that would make you eligible for the treatment. Um, other than that, I think my contact information was on that last slide and it'll be uh, attached to this presentation. So folks that want more information, feel free to contact me directly. Thanks. So more help in uh, learning what trees are in your woods. That's definitely one where uh, for hiring a forester or even walking out with one of us again, that I don't know if we mentioned that's a free service. Um, what we do, the walk and talks, that's completely free. Um, that can be a great, a great starting point. Uh, so either us or just jump right into the deep end and hire an actual forester to come out and, and do some work with you. That's a great way to learn what trees are in the woods. Or you can um, do some IDing yourself with the Forestry is the main book. Just plug that again real quick. <laughs> we also have a tree ID video up on the uh, on the website, and I think the link to that. Uh, I know it's in our exhibit booth. Uh, you can also find it on our website, or contact me, and I'll I'll get you there. Okay, so um, in terms of uh, biggest trees, we we do have a, a, a big tree program that's overseen by a Augusta staff. Uh, Jan Santer does the uh, main big tree program. Um, Andy, was her contact information in that slide or? I'm not sure, but we, we do have a program that does uh, keep keep records of the biggest trees. 
Yes, if you do a search for the main big tree registry, it'll you'll be able to find it um, right on our website. And that, that lists all of the biggest trees and says where they are for the most part um, by species and also whatever the, the champion biggest one is. But uh, that's that's always up for for competition. So if you think you've got the biggest one, definitely reach out to Jan and, and, uh, and we're all happy to measure them and try to make sure that the biggest one really is the biggest one. It's also worth getting on the list. You might be the biggest tree in your county or town. You might have the biggest tree. And, you know, occasionally those big trees do pass on, which means that your tree could be next. So at the I'll uh, jump in here. How do I know what my trees are worth? Um, again, it really comes back to knowing what kind of trees you have, what, uh, you know, their, their shape and their form whether parts of those trees uh, would meet the specifications for different forest products such as saw logs, pulpwood, firewood, etc. Best way to find this out is again work with a licensed forester to either just take a walk through the woods or more specifically to, to take some information to measure some trees, work up some volume data, and then use our um, stumpage guides uh, which Maine Fire Service does collect information about stumpage, which by the way, that is defined as the value of the tree on the stump before it's been cut, yarded and delivered, but its value uh, is determined in terms of what it would be worth once all those activities happen and it gets to the, to the mill or the lumber yard. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a complicated question and a lot depends on whether you need to know in, with very high degree of uh, specificity, you know, for the purposes of um, determining estate values or something like that, or if you just want a general ballpark uh, idea. Uh, working with a forester can, can help a lot there. And again, that might be a service you'd hire um, a consulting forester to do to uh, write up a, a timber est estimate for, you, for your woodlot. I guess I'll just add there that markets play a huge role in what, what wood is that worth too. Absolutely. And markets uh, can change almost as, as quickly as the weather. Um, stuff happens. So in that regard, um, our stumpage reports are tend to be a bit behind the times. So another way to, if you're, if you're tuned into what you have on your wood lot already, and you want up-to-date information, you might want to talk to a logger or a log buyer, a wood buyer, who can give you a better idea what your particular products are, are valued at, you know, at the moment. In, and it, it'll change where you are in the state, too. Uh, we don't have one market for the whole state. We have a lot of regional markets that overlap. Unfortunately, the uh, stumpage report is actually broken down by county. So you can find your county and get at least a little bit better indicator of if um, you're in one corner of the state, how that may affect the prices available. But um, I'll also add that at the risk of sounding like a broken record, if you are considering doing a timber harvest, we strongly, strongly recommend that you work with a forester. Um, they kind of will act as your advocate and be able to help facilitate what you're getting for a price. So that can be really important. Theoretically, they're also someone who's working more closely in real time with the rates and have, have a good idea of what rates may be fair and what maybe not isn't fair. So that's another key thing there. Well, I guess I'll take this one too, since in my role as landowner outreach forester, Talking to people about the tree growth tax law is probably the number one uh, beginning to a conversation. Of course, it can lead to a lot of things. 
But in short, the tree growth tax law is what's known as a current use property tax program. And this is all about property tax. It's not about income tax or any other type of tax. Uh, as you know, property tax, or you may not know, but property tax in Maine is a local affair. So ultimately, the tree growth tax law is administered by um, the local tax assessor in your town. If your woodlot's in an unorganized township, then the Maine Revenue Service is your assessor. Um, there's a lot of things that anybody should know before enrolling their land or if they're buying land that is already enrolled. One key uh, point in that situation is that tree growth tax uh, law runs with the land, not the landowner. So if you're buying land that's already enrolled, you will have one year to make a decision uh, after you buy it, after you're closing. Uh, you have a year to make a decision about keeping it in the tree growth tax program and what to do about your forest management plan. A lot of the details for the tree growth are in, in a publication called Property Tax Bulletin Number 19. Uh, but two key things to remember, if you're the, you have land that's enrolled, those acres um, need to be managed primarily to grow and harvest commercial timber products. Um, and the other thing is that that must be done according to a written forest management plan that is renewed at least every 10 years with the involvement, if not written outright, by a licensed, a main licensed forester. At least a, a licensed forester has looked over the plan and signed off on it. So again, uh, you can contact any of your district foresters or myself directly and be happy to talk over your particular situation because um, sometimes uh, that's, that's the best way to figure out what it is you need to know. Sure. So uh, selecting the best trees on your farm, um, tallest, widest, whatever it may be. Um, I guess the, the quick answer to that would be it depends, like it is for most things. But um, so that kind of goes back to figuring out what it is you want to get out of your property. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're interested in growing your trees for their financial return, the ones that you want to grow would be the straightest with the least amount of branches. Um, tall is always good too, because uh, when you're looking at saw logs or trying to create saw logs, you're you're getting paid based on two parameters. So quality and quantity, basically. So that's scale and grade. Um, scale is the amount that's there and grade is the quality. So the taller and straighter the tree, the better the grade and, and the scale. Um, but if you are interested in trying to promote wildlife, that may not be the kind of tree you want to keep. You may be more interested in growing some trees that are uh, less merchantable. Um, some of the big, ugly cabbage pines can have some really great uh, ability to have wildlife. Anything with a cavity is fantastic for birds, little critters. Um, so figuring out, before you can figure out what trees to grow, I guess the best thing to do is to figure out what you want to get out of those trees. But the, the, the quick answer, um, most people are going for value. That would be big, straight, no branches. Um, and depending on what you've got for trees, but that's pretty much always the, the answer to that question. And then I think it's important to note, note that uh, species composition plays a big role in that too. Not all species of trees are, are worth the same amount of money. You could have a, a really well-formed beech tree, for example, but it's not going to be worth nearly as much as a not as well-formed sugar maple, or, for example, just because the way the market conditions are that there's a much more higher demand for sugar maple lumber than there is, say, beech. Well, the question is about uh, replacing oak trees that uh, finally give in after continuous uh, defoliation from brown tail moth, or I suppose you could extend this question to other insects uh, like gypsy moth after numbers of years of, uh, if, if we were to have another gypsy moth infestation. And um, as Julie mentioned, the, the, the first best answer to most of these questions is it depends. Um, what what do you want there? What are, what is the sort of reason for those trees? 
Um, a lot of times trees are just there because they're there. We grow trees in Maine very easily. Uh, the chances are that as those uh, brown tail moth trees give up, there's already trees in that particular stand or copes that are there to take over for it. Um, and you may be just as well to work with those as trying to plant another tree. But one of the biggest reasons to plant trees in Maine would be if you want a particular species that's not already on site. So if you want to replace oaks, and those are generally red oaks, with more red oaks, um, you could do that. You would have to, you know, work with find uh, red oak seedlings at a at a nursery, and then, um, you know, kind of. But besides planting trees, you need to care for them, <laughs> um, and there are sort of right ways and not so right ways to plant trees and to care for them. Uh, without uh, spending too much more of our time on that now, I'll say that there's information on our website or you can contact a district forester or speak to me or to our urban and community forester, Jan Santer, about tree planting and care. So that's a really good question. Um, the regional differences across Maine woodlots um, are huge, not only in composition, but absolutely in market options and land use and legacy. Um, farther south, the, the common, like in York County, uh, really common forest type is pine oak, whereas as you get into the northern parts of Maine, that component of oak almost disappears from the Maine forest. So um, the trees are really different. Of course, what trees grow drives the market. So there's much different markets available in Northern Maine as there is in Southern Maine, but also the, the goal in land ownership is very different. I know probably a lot of you are aware that the Northern part of the state is a lot of privately owned land. It's um, owned by companies who their reason for owning it is to grow and harvest timber um, and try to get an investment back off owning that land. And that's very different from the folks that may have land farther south that just own a couple acres behind their house because they don't want to have a neighbor's house that they can see. So um, huge, huge differences. And, and that drives uh, each of our districts being di very different. And so we're kind of all adapted to deal with different issues depending on where we are. But it would be really hard to, to, you know, do one style of forestry and have it work in the whole state. It definitely is a game of how to manage what you got and different goals in different places. Does that kind of answer the question? I'm not sure. Jimmy and Andy, you might want to jump in as well. Well, just from a land use legacy standpoint, um, you know, Southern Maine was much more aggressively farmed and used for agriculture in uh, previous centuries, whereas much of Northern Maine is, is primary forest in the sense that it was never uh, used for anything other than just forest. It was never, is it ever plowed like much of southern New England was plowed uh, and tilled for agriculture? So that that legacy still stands to this day. You can, you know, a lot of central Maine and southern Maine, you still have that legacy of of pasture pine, like large areas of almost monoculture pine. That's a product of of old old agricultural abandonment. Um, yeah, markets are different as well. Um, they, like Julie mentioned that. The southern part of the state has much much more pine and oak, so a lot of the markets there, you know, are there to uh, capitalize on the species that are there. Whereas, you know, your 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 northern Maine um, markets are much more uh, geared towards um, like studwood as well as uh, pulpwood products. Um, in terms of, uh, I th I think that kind of answers most of the question. Andy might have something to add as well. Sure, I'll I'll add to that. It's all good information, uh, Julie and Jim. Um, another thing that can make differences has a lot to do with soil and and site characteristics. And in general, uh, the soils in southern Maine are perhaps a little more productive. Um, although, again, that can vary a lot. What I really want to say is that uh, the a good a good process sort of um, a, a stewardship story line might apply across the whole state. And that would be to first, as a landowner, articulate your goals and objectives. Secondly, work with professionals, find out what you have to work with um, and also what's out there around you for markets. And then 
come up with a strategy, a, a series of actions uh, that will help you reach your goals, working with what you have, uh, both on your land and in your neighborhood. So in that sense, I would say that uh, uh, it's, you know, we, we certainly try to um, promote that across the entire state because that approach can work uh, for almost any landowner in any situation. <laughs> well, that's a great one for us to go out on um, because uh, the next talk, if you want to stay tuned, is actually with the folks from the Forest Health Division, and they are going to be talking all about what could be bugging your trees. So that would be my advice is to stay tuned and check out that next talk. Absolutely. Uh, seconding all of that. And uh, just want to say that you have our contact information and you see that email, forestinfo at maine.gov. Uh, if we didn't answer your question yet, uh, please uh, send it in to us. We will answer it. Um, and uh, again, thank you to all the folks who were attending, sending in questions, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hello, please use this attendee guide for tips on how to use the Whova event app to watch conference sessions during the main ag trade show online. In order to use the Whova event app, you must pre-register for access to the mobile or computer app. To register, go to www.main dot gov forward slash dacf forward slash ag trade show. In this example, we show you what it looks like when you're using a computer browser and the Whova event app. In the Whova event app, you can click on the agenda icon. Clicking on that icon allows you to see the full range of conference presentation sessions. You can move back and forth between the different sessions offered each day. When you scroll down, you'll be able to click View Session. Some sessions might not be live just yet, but take a moment to look around and use some of the networking features. The chat and community features allow you to interact with presenters and other attendees. If there's a poll enabled, go ahead and answer it. Click the submit button when you're done. In addition to the agenda icon, you can go to the community icon and find a meetup. These meetups allow you to interact with exhibitors, departmental staff, and service providers, as well as other attendees. You can even suggest your own meetup. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at the show.
Hello, please use this attendee guide for tips on how to use the Whova event app to watch conference sessions during the main ag trade show online. In order to use the Whova event app, you must pre-register for access to the mobile or computer app. To register, go to www dot main dot gov forward slash dacf forward slash ag trade show in this example we show you what it looks like when you're using a computer browser and the whova event app in the whova event app you can click on the agenda icon Clicking on that icon allows you to see the full range of conference presentation sessions. You can move back and forth between the different sessions offered each day. When you scroll down, you'll be able to click View Sessions. Some sessions might not be live just yet, but take a moment to look around and use some of the networking features. The chat and community features allow you to interact with presenters and other attendees. If there's a poll enabled, go ahead and answer it. Click the submit button when you're done. In addition to the agenda icon, you can go to the community icon and find a meetup. These meetups allow you to interact with exhibitors, departmental staff, and service providers, as well as other attendees. You can even suggest your own meetup. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at the show. Good morning, everyone. There I am. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Forest Health segment of today's three-part video uh, series from the Maine Forest Service. I'm Mike Parisio. I'm going to be your host today. I'm a forest entomologist here at the Insect and Disease Lab, and I can't see who's out there, but I sure hope there's hundreds of you. Welcome, and we've got a real treat for you. Uh, usually, we, as we all know, we, we'd be together in person, so we had to get a little bit uh, creative this year. So what we've done, instead of uh, making you sit there and listen to me talk the entire time, we've uh, created a series of video shorts with some pest uh, management activities that can be performed right here during the winter months. So what we'll do is we'll play uh, the video series. We have four videos prepared for you today. Um, and uh, after each one of those videos, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, questions about that specific insect uh, in between breaks there, and then we'll uh, proceed throughout all four videos. So uh, 
With that being said, we'll jump right into it. Again, thanks for tuning in. We're going to start you off with a video on Hemlock Woolly Adelgid presented by Wayne Cyrils. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Wayne Searles, and I'm with the Maine Forest Service. I'm an entomology technician, and I'm here today to show you folks just what I look for when I'm looking for hemlock woolly adelgia. I've been doing this for quite a long time, a number of years, as a matter of fact, and through those years, found that you will generally find this pest in trees that occupy territory next to a stream, next to a trail, whether it's people traffic, whether it's animal traffic, uh, along streams, again, where, where uh, animals might be traversing and maybe moving it around. But at the same time, what I'd like to say is that uh, you will find different levels of this critter. And when you're on your woodlot, the first thing, you don't want to find it. Absolutely don't want to find it, but you got to go out there thinking you, do, you might find it. So I'm going to show you now some different levels of populations that I have seen over the years. You will sometimes find very little uh, activity going on. And in this case, we got a solitary uh, sack or, or piece of wool on this little uh, branch, a twig. And this is so common that you have to really focus to find these guys. And uh, I guess if it was me, I would say this would be a trace. There are others on this particular branch, but this one I just wanted to point out to you. This is another twig on the same branch that is a little bit heavier. This here, I'd classify this as light. And although we usually rate these in four categories, I would, uh, I think personally, I'd call this a heavy. Uh, we do have a moderate category that is probably all over this uh, tree in places. But for the sake of showing you what I am today, again, all three of these twigs are off the same branch. So um, pretty, pretty striking. And this is when you know it's really heavy, when you look down upon it, actually, and see the see the wool as heavy as this. Now, as you can see, this does have current year's growth. So this had good growth in 2020, a relatively good growth. But with that amount of insects on the tissue and drawing the juices out that they will, this very rapidly will uh, decline. And it, it can be pretty amazing how quick it happens. But uh, yeah, it'll get to a point where they will not be putting out any current year's growth and that's when the tree really starts showing the decline. As you are out in your woodlot and as you come across this particular pest, uh, I wouldn't get too alarmed early on unless it's really heavy. At that point, you'd want to talk to your forester. We are always at the lab. Somebody will always be there to answer your call. We'll gladly come out and look at your woodlot if you have questions there. But uh, So this has nothing to do with the management of your woodlot as much as it is just to show you what we're doing when we're doing a detection survey. And that's what we're doing. All right, so there you have it. There's a little bit of information about hemlock uh, woolly adelgid and some uh, winter scouting activities that you can do. So at this point in the presentation, I would be happy to, uh, to answer any questions about uh, hemlock woolly adelgid in particular. Otherwise, if you don't think of it uh, right now, we'll certainly return for uh, questions and answers at the end of, of the presentation when all the videos have played. So we have a question. I want to log my hemlock stand. What is the best time of year to do that to avoid spreading hemlock woolly adelgid? Um, the simple answer to that is right about now. So uh, at this point in the winter, um, the insect is not uh, at risk of being spread very much because it's not in its mobile phase. So up until the late winter uh, from, from late summer there is really the safest uh, period of time. To, uh, to do so, um, when you get into you know late winter, early spring, and then throughout the early summer months, uh, 
At that point in time uh, in the insect's life cycle, it has what's known as a crawler uh, phase, which is actually mobile. So not highly mobile, but uh, they do uh, they do hitchhike, um, you know, both uh, through human means and on things like birds and stuff like that. So um, that's the highest risk. And it doesn't take much for uh, for this particular insect to uh, to get reestablished if you move it, because they actually reproduce asexually here in North America. Um, and so all hemlock woolly adelgid are actually female. And so a single uh, organism can actually start a, a new population if it's brought to uh, the wrong place and it finds uh, suitable conditions. So another thing we like to recommend, a lot of folks love to uh, feed the birds, which is great during the winter months, but during those uh, spring and summer months when there's lots of natural forage for birds out there, um, basically it's not really necessary to be feeding them. And, you know, birds that have it, uh, tend to roost in hemlock and things like that or another natural way that it moves from from point a to point b so uh when you have birds congregating uh, that might have crawlers on them at you know food sources like feeders and stuff it's a great way for the the crawlers to actually get onto bird feeders and then onto other birds so you can really uh, uh speed up um distribution that way <clears throat> Okay, so how can I treat hemlock woolly adelgid? It's not the easiest insect to uh, to treat. There are a few feasible management options in the forest, um, but um, ornamental trees can be managed with some certain uh, chemical means. You know, one of those being horticultural oils and soaps that are available to uh, to landowners, and there are also some uh, systemic and in insecticides. So a lot of times. The issue there is, you know, getting adequate co uh, coverage, especially with something um like a, uh, a horticultural oil but um the best means if you have a, a, a hemlock uh, woolly adelgid infestation is to uh, to contact and work with a licensed pesticide applicator to know the, uh, the best treatments for your specific scenario and, and what's going to work best in your specific environment again that'll vary depending on the number of trees the distribution of trees you know whether we're talking a, a single you know, yard tree or, or a forest stand. So uh, that's always the best way to go. These are the people that work with this stuff uh, the most and, and most regularly. So they really know the ins and outs of what might be effective for your uh, particular situation. Okay, so seeing no other questions right now, again, feel free to ask them at the end of the entire segment. We're going to move on to the next video. So that's going to be about emerald ash borer here in Maine, and that will be presented by our forest entomologist, Colleen Tierling. Let's go to EAB. Hi, I'm Colleen Tierling, and I'm an entomologist with the Maine Forest Service, and I work with emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is spreading from the southernmost part of the state and the northern, oh, northernmost part of the state where it is established. When you see this kind of woodpecker feeding, it usually is due to emerald ash borer. So wood, when woodpeckers feed on insects in the bark or underneath the bark, they often will flick off the outer bark and this leaves the bright blonde inner bark visible. And in ash trees, this becomes a very distinctive pattern and is easy to see as the bright blonde bark shows up against the darker outer bark. If you can peel back the bark enough to see what kind of insect galleries or tracks there are or any insects that are available, you should be able to tell whether it's emerald ash borer or some other species. So emerald ash borer galleries are, are sinuous S-shaped galleries. Um, when there's only one or two emerald ash borer, you can easily see that, that typical S-shaped gallery. When there's a lot of emerald ash borer, they tend to crisscross over each other and you just see a maze of, of galleries. If the woodpeckers are feeding on native bark beetles, which um, overwinter in the bark, the holes usually only go partway down the bark. So if you peel back the bark um, and the hole stops partway through the bark, then you know um, it is not emerald ash borer. So we are not looking for deep woodpecker holes like these pileated woodpecker holes. We're looking more for surface feeding um, just under the bark. When you're out walking in your woodlot in the winter, there are several signs and symptoms of emerald ash borer that you can be looking for. Um, the woodpecker feeding damage is probably the most common, um, commonly seen one in Maine, but there are also other things 
like epicormic growth or water sprouts. Uh, we also sometimes will see barks, or cracks in the bark. Um, this is because as the EAB feeds underneath the bark, the bark tends to um, dry out and crack. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about emerald ash borer, go to our website. If you are in an area where emerald ash borer is not known to be, if you see any of these signs and symptoms, please give us a call. Thanks a lot for helping us monitor for emerald ash borer. Okay, and yeah, Colleen is exactly right there. Uh, we're going to be seeing more and more of this uh, across Maine, unfortunately. So uh, surveillance for, for the early signs of infestation, especially that woodpecker damage, is, is really critical uh, for us to know about to, to help know where EAB is in the state and, and help to better manage it. So uh, please, if you do see anything like that, call it in to us. So uh, happy to take any questions about emerald ash borer now. Okay, so we have a question here relating to emerald ash borer biological control. So uh, as mentioned there, uh, we are currently releasing biological control parasitoids here in the state of Maine to, Maine to, uh, to help manage EAB populations in the future. And the question is, how do you know that the wasps you're releasing for EAB won't become a problem? So that's probably one of the, uh, the most common questions we get. And uh, yeah, biological control has, has certainly had some shortcomings in its early history where uh, things might have been released that, that didn't have the appropriate host specificity, but that's one of the beautiful things about the insect world is um, there's so many species out there. So Hymenoptera wasps and uh, the Coleoptera, the beetles are, are two of the most speciose orders there are. And so when you have that many species out there, you can really afford to become highly, highly, highly specialized. And so that's what a lot of insects do. And they really only have a, a very small set of, uh, of things that they, they operate with. So a lot of species uh, interactions in the insect world are one-to-one. -one. So these, uh, these biological control agents we're releasing have an extremely small uh, host range, you know, meaning things that they attack. And so EAB is one of them. And uh, um, certainly there are some, some documented cases uh, once in a while of them attacking other closely related uh, uh, beetles to, to emerald ash borer, but they don't complete their life cycle successfully. So that it's really the only thing they can rely on. They can't, uh, you know, just expand to start utilizing any other insect out there. So from a, from a biological control standpoint, they're very safe. So uh, we feel comfortable releasing them and, and we hope they'll help us in the future. Um, let's see, we have any more questions? Where has the emerald ash borer been found in Maine? So at present, uh, we know of two core infested areas, so to speak. So I'll start in northern Maine, so in northernmost Aroostook County. Um, just a, across the Canadian border, there was an infestation of emerald ash borer that has spilled over into Maine, unfortunately. So it's really along the Canadian border up there. Um, and then in southernmost Maine, uh, we know that emerald ash borer is on the New Hampshire border, and that has spilled over as well. So uh, York County being the most heavily infested area, but then also we know we have some some early infestations in uh, in Cumberland County, you know, most notably the city of Portland. So uh, at both ends of the state, um, we do have some some early stages of emerald ash borer infestation. Both those. Um, infested areas were detected in 2018. So uh, in the span of a couple of years here, we haven't seen major expansion. Uh, we have seen some expansion within those, those areas, but uh, it's important to note that the core areas of Maine, the central part of the state between those two areas is still EAB free. So pretty much more than 90% of the ash uh, in Maine are still safe uh, for the time being. They're not infested. And so we're, we're hoping to preserve that, that ash resource for as long as possible. And all that information can be found on our website. We have maps that uh, show those infested areas. So feel free to check out those maps on the website. More questions. What is Maine doing in response to emerald ash borer? So we're doing a number of things. So uh, I'll start with um, basically our, our surveillance efforts. So the first part of the, uh, the game is knowing where emerald ash borer is in the state. So we do a variety of things to monitor for emerald ash borer. 
Uh, if you've seen those purple prism traps hanging in the trees, those aren't bat traps or anything like that. Those are specifically designed for emerald ash borers. So we continue to, uh, to hang those across the state. So those are visually attractive to the adult beetles, and we can use those to, uh, to see if we catch any um, adult beetles on them. They're coated in, in really sticky glue, so they capture anything that um, is attracted to them. Um, we also monitor for emerald ash borer through girdle trap trees. So we have a, a program for that. And uh, if anyone's interested in getting involved in that, again, you can sign up for that program to be considered uh, on our website. So that involves going out in the uh, the spring months and, and girdling an ash tree um, to kind of stress it out. And it, uh, by doing so, it produces some different uh, chemicals and volatiles that uh, EAB, the adult uh, females, can pick up on. So they're more likely to infest those stress trees. And uh, so we'll allow them to, uh, to attack those trees if they're present in, in an area uh, for the summer months there. They'll lay eggs and then we'll go back in the, uh, the fall and we'll cut those trees down and destructive, uh, destructively sample them. As you saw Colleen in the video there, uh, peeling the bark back. That's what we'll do with the um, the uh, the logs there um, after we've cut them down. Um, we use biosurveillance. So there's a ground nesting wasp called Spumacanus that uh, exists in areas of southern Maine. Uh, they can be found in you know old abandoned ball fields and stuff like that. So uh, these wasps actually hunt uh, beetles related to uh, emerald ash borer. So now that emerald ash borer is here. Uh, they actually hunt them too. So we monitor the colonies to see what beetles are being brought back there. And we've, we've even, you know, had EAB recovered that way. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, we enforce uh, forestry and nursery quarantine. So, uh, you know, we forbid uh, ash nursery stock from being brought into the state. Um, and then we also regulate ash products. So things like logs that uh, could potentially be infested with um, with emerald ash borer, um, we don't uh, allow those to freely move. You know, we, we regulate those or forbid that movement in um, in some places there. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, we perform as much outreach as possible. You know, we can't obviously keep up with uh, EAB, uh, just the, the staff of the Maine Forest Service. So we, we regularly work with uh, landowners and, uh, you know, provide presentations like this to make sure people know uh, what they're looking for um, and to help us out with, with especially detection and, and knowing where EAB is. So um, among other things, but those are the basics. So uh, any other questions for Emerald Ash Borer? Do the wasps sting people? So that's another important question. Um, if you say the word wasp, yeah, people tend to associate that with things like, you know, bald face hornets or yellow jackets or, or paper wasps. But um, the wasps I'm referring to for biological control are minuscule. Um, they're they're super tiny and they are stingless. So uh, some wasps, uh, like yellow jackets, they can use their their stinger for um, for stinging people and injecting venom. These wasps actually use the the stinger portion of their anatomy to uh, to lay eggs only. So that's what they're using it for. And uh, no, they are they are totally unable to sting or harm humans or your dog or or any anything else. They they really just harm emerald ash borer, and that's what we want them to do. So. Other questions for EAB? Okay, looks like that's it for EAB for the time being. So up next is a real treat. Uh, you'll see yours truly uh, talk about gypsy moth. So let's cut to that gypsy moth video. Hi everybody, I'm forest entomologist Mike Parisio with the Maine Forest Service and I'm here today to talk to you about one of our important forest pests here in Maine, European gypsy moth. Winter is one of the best times to scout your own woodlands for this pest due to the fact that they lay large, visible egg masses on the trunks of trees and you can also perform some easy management when the opportunity presents itself. Oak and aspen are some of the preferred hosts of gypsy moth and so that's a great place to focus your search for egg masses in the winter. And you can see just how well they stick out against the dark bark of some trees. When I'm out in my own woods looking for gypsy moth, I carry a closable container with me and a putty knife to scrape the egg masses off with. Anything with a durable edge can be used though. After that, I'll take the container back to a place where I can fill it with soapy water and I'll let it sit for a few days to make sure I kill all the gypsy moth eggs. Sometimes when egg masses are really tucked away, like in the deep furrows on this sugar maple here, you won't always be able to get them into a container, but scraping them onto the ground is better than doing nothing. 
It's really important to mention that gypsy moth will lay eggs on just about anything, and egg masses can be found on man-made items as well, such as RVs or boat trailers. When you're traveling around Maine, it's important to check your equipment for gypsy moth egg masses and make sure you're not transporting this pest around the state. Gypsy moth will lay its egg masses just about anywhere, so make sure to look high, low, and in between. On behalf of the Maine Forest Service Insect and Disease Lab, thanks again for spending a virtual afternoon with me out in the woods. I hope you don't find anything like this, but if you do, now you know what to do. All right. Well, don't worry. I won't be trading in a career in entomology for acting anytime soon, but uh, hopefully that was relatively painless. So I would be happy to take any questions about gypsy moth. <clears throat> question. My oaks were defoliated. How can I tell if it was gypsy moth? That's a great question. It's not always obvious. So um, we do have quite a few defoliators uh, working here in Maine. So uh, at current, probably the, the most commonly encountered, which we'll see in the next video, that's brown tail moth. So I'll compare uh, brown tail moth and gypsy moth just for the sake of those are probably the two that could uh, be most easily confused. So there's certain evidence uh, provided by both that can kind of tell you um, which uh, which critter has been, been working on your trees. Uh, and sometimes it can be both. We've started to see this. I saw this a couple times this year. So the main differences between brown tail moth and gypsy moth, although they're both large, hairy, ugly caterpillars, uh, brown tail moth, uh, you know, as the name kind of implies, it's, um, you know, it's largely a brown moth. And then um, on the back, it'll have some, some small white markings. But the, the key to identifying the caterpillars, it has two bright orange spots, at least on the mature caterpillars, which is probably when you would notice it the most. So right at the tail end. So compared to gypsy moth, which has a whole series of dark blue and dark red uh, spots running down its back in pairs. So that's how you tell the caterpillars apart. Um, the feeding damage is going to look a lot the same, but then uh, later on, you know, the, the egg laying uh, um, habits are a little bit different. So as you saw in that last video, um, you saw what the gypsy moth egg masses look like. So those buff colored, you know, kind of smooth quarter sized egg masses, usually plastered, you know, onto uh, the sides of trees directly on the trunk or like I, I mentioned, man-made um items compared to brown tail moth. So they really lay their uh, their eggs on leaves themselves on the oak trees. So they'll put, you know, similar looking egg masses, you know, they'll, um, they'll put them right on the leaves themselves and kind of uh, glue a couple of the leaves together with webbing as well. So uh, um, not to say that either one doesn't, you know, perform the other one, but that's the most common thing. And then, um, yeah, again, gypsy moth as well, in addition to uh, the egg masses you saw, leaves behind some really obvious you know, big, ugly uh, pupil casings, you know, mostly in the same area there. A lot of that life cycles um, happening at certain points right in a uh, confined area there. So um, that's that's how you best tell. And uh, also if you're, yeah, well, I won't get into it. I'll let, I'll let us watch the next video before I elaborate any more on brown tail moth. So other questions for, uh, for gypsy moth. I can't reach gypsy moth egg masses on my trees. What else can I do? So that's a good point. You know, this, uh, the video was shot in an area with an unusually high number of egg masses. So um, they were down at eye level, but um, I'll just say, you know, when you think you're licked, you know, get creative, you know, a garden hoe, for example, can uh, extend your reach, you know, another, you know, four or five, six feet or, you know, whatever you have. Um, I wouldn't necessarily go through the trouble of uh, getting on a ladder to do some of this stuff. Uh, in some situations, you might be inclined to do so, and it might be safe. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put yourself at risk necessarily in the woods on a ladder. And uh, um, yeah, this is this is really just you know intended to be you know a, a fun activity for us to get out of the house. You're not going to necessarily um, perform any huge population management, but. Um, Otherwise, you know, a lot of the times in low populations, if you do see gypsy moth egg masses, they will be further up in the canopy there. Um, you know, they're, they're a lot of the time right underneath the, uh, you know, major branches and stuff on the underside like that. So it's really, you know, even if you can't necessarily manage them, um, you know, it's a good idea to know that they're there. That way you're not surprised, you know, if you do have, you know, defoliation and caterpillars the, uh, the next season there. 
So, um, yeah, nobody likes being surprised by that. So just, just keep an eye on it. It's really, you know, a good monitoring tool, even if you can't manage it. Um, other questions. Is gypsy moth statewide? Where is it found in Maine? So, yes, gypsy moth is a, a, a great disperser. So this, this whole, you know, introduction to North America began, you know, a couple hundred years ago, but uh, right in Boston, uh, greater Boston area. And so, you know, in the... Uh, headed west the leading edge of the gypsy moth uh, uh range in in the u.s here is is now breaching you know the minnesota border you know uh, and the wisconsin it's through wisconsin but uh creeping into minnesota so um yeah we've had partial quarantines to to represent you know the known range of gypsy moth in maine over the year at this point we know through pheromone trapping that it really is um statewide and uh we did get a number of reports this year, so ranging from you know Bethel in Oxford County to to Holt and up in Aristic, so uh, really spanning the state, and even in northern areas where you wouldn't expect to, to find it, like northern Aristic uh, County, you know we do get it in our traps, and we uncover we recover gypsy moth in um, adult males in a lot of our other traps, you know things like spruce budworm traps and on those purple prism traps. So um through our other trapping activities we really know that it is unfortunately statewide so uh well we can't do it to keep uh anything to keep it from certain areas of the state we can certainly you know make sure we don't arbitrarily you know move it around more than we have to so you know especially moving log products and stuff like that just making sure that uh those logs are free of those egg masses is, is really simple work to do and uh you know it doesn't involve a lot of effort and it can prevent a lot of damage next question <clears throat> How can I tell the difference between gypsy moth and brown tail moth? I think we uh, we went over that uh, in that question of how can we tell which is which. But uh, again, different different life stages. You know, the the caterpillars, uh, even though they're both large, hairy, ugly caterpillars, you know, they have different patterns. Again, brown tail moth having two bright orange spots on its tail end versus gypsy moth having a series of paired dark blue and dark red spots. Um, they, they go after a lot of the same hosts, so uh, a lot of the times you are going to find them in the same environments. Um, uh, they do differ in, in their phenology. Gypsy moth occurs a little later in the year, you know, as mature caterpillars versus brown tail moth. You know, that won't always help you, but in some situations it could if, uh, if you're looking at the foliation and you don't necessarily have the, the caterpillars there to judge by and then um yeah again the uh the habits of where the egg masses are laid if they're you know you see clumps of leaves and you peel them apart and you find egg masses in there you know that's that's brown tail moth versus gypsy moth which really lays its uh egg masses in more exposed areas right on the surface of uh you know trees or, or man-made items so other questions all right, I think that's it for gypsy moth. So last but not least, uh, maybe the one that folks are most interested in, we'll, we'll get into talking about brown tail moth and our forest entomologist Tom Schmelk will, uh, will star in that video. So here we go. My name is Tom Schmelk. I'm one of the forest entomologists for the Maine Forest Service. And today we're out here looking at brown tail moth. So one thing homeowners can do in their own yard or woodlot is to survey for brown tail moth winter webs. So you want to do this on a nice bright sunny day and stand with the sun to your back and look up at the tops of the trees. The new webs will be right at the tips of the branches. The webs will shine in the sunlight because of the nice bright white silk that comprises most of the web. Knowing which trees to target for treatment, whether that be clipping, injections, or spraying, will make management more effective. So if you do choose to prune out the winter webs, you'll need a few tools, including hand pruners, gloves, a bucket of soapy water, and if the webs are a little higher up, a pole pruner. So what you wanna do is snip off the very tip of the branch, the part that contains the web. Taking more off, it might harm the tree and is probably unnecessary. After you clip the web, you wanna destroy it. The caterpillars are very good at finding food, and if you leave them on the ground, the caterpillars will just climb back up the tree in the spring and it'll be like you hadn't done anything at all. To destroy the webs, you can soak them in a bucket of soapy water for a few days or burn them, which can be a fun family or community activity. Thanks for surveying with us. Now go out and get them.
Okay, that looks like uh, all we have. So uh, at this point, I take any brown tail moth questions first, and then we can uh, circle back if there's any additional questions about anything we talked about today. Any questions? <clears throat> what is the best way to destroy brown tail moss nests too high to reach in a single tree? So, uh, yeah, obviously, as as is with all the uh, insects we've we've talked about today, there is a uh, certainly a limitation to what the average homeowner can do with the equipment they have. So, uh, you know, uh, pole pruners, uh, even if you don't have them, you know, they they could be a good investment uh, depending on your your situation and. Uh, I don't know the specifics of which locations, but I believe even libraries in some uh, heavily infested towns have a, uh, a pole pruner lending program. So that can certainly help you get some of those high up ones. Um, basically, yeah, you know, and then uh, beyond that, you know, if, if you're in need of professional help, uh, the Maine Forest Service on our website uh, maintains a list of uh, licensed arborists that are willing to come out and uh, you know, depending on your geographic location, um, it might be available in some areas, it might not, but they can actually bring a bucket truck and they can go up to the top of some taller trees and uh, and help to physically remove those those uh, webs as well. Um, sometimes it'll be beyond the reach of even that and there, there's really nothing we can do about that, unfortunately. So uh, it is a problem we, uh, we have to live with in some situations, um, but being aware of uh, you know, certain things, you know, like especially the health risks associated with brown tail moth, you know, the uh, the skin rashes and the respiratory problems. So just knowing that you have a population, even if there's nothing uh, you can do to manage, it can help you take some precautions for yourself to, to protect your health. Next question. Are all webs on trees brown tail moth webs? That's a good question. So uh, I would say no to that. So uh, it is a uh, probably one of the most common things we're, we're seeing right now. So uh, if you have a, a oak with, uh, you know, that, that has those little webs like appear in the video, it's, it's pretty much a safe bet. But um, it's important to know, you know, if you're not examining this stuff up, up close and personal, you know, some oaks, they really don't uh, tend to drop some leaves in, in the winter months. And so it might just be some, some, uh, some leaves that are hanging on through the winter months at the end of a branch tip. Um, you know, during the growing season, you know, going going back, you know, we do have a lot of other nests that appear uh, in uh, in Maine. So uh, eastern tent caterpillar, you know, that's something we commonly get a lot of calls about, uh, confusing with with brown tail moth webs. So we use the timing of, of the year to tell the difference between the two and pass that information along. So eastern tent caterpillar appears in the spring months, and uh, you know, mostly those webs are going to be. Um, in the crotch, uh, branch crotches of, of small trees and things like that. So uh, brown tail moth, uh, the nests are really always located at the uh, the outermost uh, branch tips and stuff like that. Um, this past year, we also saw a ton of fall webworm um, here in uh, in Maine, statewide really. I, I believe we got reports from, from all corners of Maine. So uh, fall webworm, like the name implies, those, those webs uh, tend to show up in the later months, although they showed up kind of early this year. Um, but uh, at any rate, those are really large, sprawling um, uh, nests. And, um, you know, we got a lot of uh, complaints about those, like I say, but at that time of year, you know, we know that it's not brown tail moth. They really just uh, produce those small, tiny webs, um, you know, smaller than the size of your uh, your fist usually, you know, later in the year there to overwinter in. You know, those nests are actually full of uh, immature overwintering uh, larvae there. And then, uh, so yeah, once you start to see these large sprawling nests, you know, it's a safe bet that that's something like fall webworm and not a uh, brown tail moth but uh, if you have any any um confusion about what you're looking at you know that's that's what we're here for so uh take pictures and and send them in and give us a call um and uh, we'll figure out what it is but uh certainly it's it's not always brown tail moth but um yeah certainly there is a lot of it uh, around the state right now other questions what trees do brown tail moth caterpillars feed on so they have a pretty large host range um Again, here in Maine, uh, where you're most likely to find them, the oaks are, are probably by far the uh, the most um, common host in a in a forest setting. Uh, they also love fruit trees, so uh, you know they'll they'll certainly um, attack you know orchards and stuff like that. So 
fortunately in these orchard settings they are you know tend to be smaller trees that can be more easily managed even though it's a lot of work you know you can certainly reach these uh winter webs to, to help prune them to, to save your crops and stuff like that um driving around augusta here i mean they love crab apples so uh you know if you're if you're over in the lowes parking lot or, or pro, you know on the former campus by um by um where the ag trade center used to be held at the convention center you know the, the crab apples there the street trees and the, the landscaping trees those are really loaded so uh, they certainly love things like crab apples apples and other fruit trees as well <clears throat> how do i determine if i have a high population of brown tail moth in my yard and what do i do so again, you know, you, you have the basics here of, of what we're just doing on a grand scale, you know, and some of this can be done yourself. Um, you know, you can go out if the conditions are right and you can uh, you can physically count, you know, with binoculars is an easy way, you know, the, the number of uh, brown tail moth winter webs in a, in a certain tree and uh, kind of figure it out that way. And then, you know, yeah, we're happy to provide assistance. You know, if you think you have a, a raging infestation or whatever like that, you know, or verify for you. Um, we produce a, uh, a winter web survey map as, as kind of a risk map. So uh, you can use that as a resource to tell if um, you have um, a high population in your area. So that, that can be another indicator that you might want to be looking. And then, um, yeah, again, if the, if the population is determined to be high enough, you're going to want to seek professional help, you know, if, if you have the interest in doing so. So, uh, again, make use of that uh, list of uh, certified arborists and pesticide applicators that will help you deal with uh, brown tail moth in your area and uh yeah just one more thing it, it really doesn't take much you know if you know you have at least 10 10 webs in a tree you know that's enough to uh to, to actually cause discomfort again uh brown tail moth caterpillars uh predominantly have um you know irritating hair that uh, you know if you touch them or become airborne you know can cause skin reactions or respiratory problems so uh you know again it just doesn't take much um Okay, what time of year should I clip brown tail moth webs? Um, again, right now is, is a really, you know, great time to be doing that. This is a timely time to be showing you these videos. And so uh, now would be a great time to do it. Um, the caterpillars aren't active until, you know, probably April. So you have that window, but, uh, you know, you, it's safer to do it um, now when they're totally dormant. And, uh, you know, um, you wouldn't want to do it on a, on a windy day necessarily. You know, yeah. some of those little winter webs do have those irritating hairs associated with them. But on a calm winter day, um, that's that's a great time to go out and do it in the winter months. And, uh, you know, pick a day when you got nice weather and, and make it an enjoyable activity. So. More questions? <clears throat> My neighbor isn't treating their brown tail moth. Should I even bother? Um, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I would say yes. You know, you still uh, can can achieve quite a lot. Um, obviously, you know, brown tail moth and other insects don't respect property boundaries and things like that. So um, you could uh, you could actually produce some um, substantial relief for yourself by treating, even if your neighbor isn't. But uh, just be aware that you know that you might still have an existing problem. And, you know, depending on your neighbor, you know, some neighbors are closer than others. Um, you know, make sure you're talking to, to people in your neighborhood and your community, um, you know, to see if, you know, there's a particular reason why they're not. You know, it, it might be something you wouldn't expect as a, as a rationale. So, uh, you know, if you understand that things, it makes things easier if you're able to have those conversations. And uh, yeah, in certain situations, you know, if, if you're, you know, a lot of times money is a factor, you know, if you, if you can get a group together of people that are interested, you know, sometimes these, uh, these arborist companies are willing to, uh, to provide, you know, discounted rates. Uh, you know, that's no guarantee obviously, but if they have a concentrated uh, amount of work in a, a concentrated area and they can eliminate, you know, all that travel in between from point A to point B, you know, it, it makes it easier for everybody. So, uh, you know, uh, look, look for resources in your community to, to kind of help tackle this problem together. So next question. Do some overwintering brown tail moth larvae get killed in a very cold winter? Um, I would say sure, some, you know, as is the same with every insect, but um, uh, really not enough to, uh, to make a, a difference in the population. They're extremely good at surviving in those, you know, tightly knit winter webs and they're huddled in there for, for warmth and survival. So, um, 
Yeah, they're uh, they're really well adapted, you know, and uh, unfortunately, you know, we see the same thing. We get a common question about emerald ash borer being killed off by the extremely cold winters. And uh, yeah, we're just not getting them as frequently. You know, not only does it take extreme cold temperatures, a lot of times it takes, you know, a duration of those temperatures. So, you know, a couple of days of sub-zero temperatures or, you know, nights of, you know, major negative temperatures and stuff like that. So, as, as we see these past couple of seasons here, you know, uh, it's, it's just inconsistent. And so we really can't rely on, on cold weather alone to uh, provide us any major, um, you know, insect relief. All right, next question. All right, do we have any more questions or is that it? All right, I think that's gonna do it for brown tail moss. So we still have a little bit of time here. So if anybody out there has any other um, questions about anything at all, then uh, then throw them in the chat box there, the question and answer box, and, and we'll get them answered for you as best I can. Are there other trees in Maine that emerald ash borer attacks? Um, there could be, um, and yeah, so so basically, like I was saying about um, the biocontrol agents and EAB, a lot of insects are super specific to the plants they feed on when they're plant feeding. So uh, emerald ash borer is highly, highly specific to the genus Fraxinus, you know, our ashes here. So here in Maine, we have white, we have green, and we have black. So all of those species are highly susceptible to uh, the emerald ash borer, unfortunately, and it, and it will cause a lot of uh, mortality among them. So the one uh, notable exception to, uh, you know, for years, you know, it was said that Fraxinus, you know, or, or ash are the only uh, trees that emerald ash borer attacks. Um, the exception is there's a tree called white fringe tree, which uh, if it occurred in Maine, it would probably only occur as a, a random ornamental or something like that. You know, it does grow uh, have a native range in, in the southern U.S. and it's used more commonly as a uh, an ornamental um, tree down there. But that is the only other documented tree species in North America um, where EAB has been shown to uh, to be able to successfully complete its entire life cycle. So you know, from egg to actively emerging as a, a healthy adult. So uh, other things that EAB might attack incidentally you know they're unable to uh, to complete their life cycle even if they manage to hatch and bore into the tree and then um so yeah really you know in maine here um we we just really focus on our white green and black ashes is, is what we really have to worry about and nothing else okay other questions Can you speak to the emerald ash borer deregulation? What does that mean for Maine? So, yeah, just to uh, just to revisit that. Um, so, ever since EAB was discovered in Michigan in the early 2000s, there have been federal uh, regulations uh, regulating the movement of ash articles that could potentially harbor EAB. Um, so, be infested and and be unknown. So. Um, yeah, up until up until recently, just January fourteenth, those those federal regulations were still in place. So they just recently went away. And um, the important part of that for Maine is that uh, our two regulated areas in Maine um, that are also under state quarantine were included in that federal quarantine area. And so also a large part of uh, well, yeah, you know, except for that that regulated area in southern Maine, the entire New Hampshire um, border with Maine was the edge of that federal uh, quarantine boundaries. So that meant that, you know, without federal permissions, regulated articles could not move out of anywhere, you know, into Maine over across that New Hampshire border. So uh, as that went away, you know, we, we've just basically adopted the same rules. We were fortunately able to act quickly and get uh, an emergency order enacted that uh, pretty much adopts all the, uh, the regulations that were formally included in that federal uh, set of regulations there. And so we'll be putting that into, you know, state law uh, after we go through the rulemaking process and, and get public comment and things like that. But um, for all intents and purposes, we've still got our, our bases covered here in Maine. So uh, we won't have any uh, regulated articles potentially harboring EAB moving freely across uh, the, the New Hampshire border uh, from anywhere, not just New Hampshire into Maine. So. 
Is there a population cycle of gypsy moss? Example, peak every X years. So uh, yeah, there is a uh, there is uh, evidence of a, a cyclical outbreak cycle for gypsy moth. Uh, what determines that outbreak cycle is, is one of the holy grails of entomology, you know, that it's not really completely understood. You know, here in Maine, um, and it, it varies regionally as well, you know, it, it tends to be about every decade, so on a 10-year cycle. So uh, the last major gypsy moth outbreak uh, to occur here in Maine was was right around 2000. You know, uh, you know, in the in the early 2000s. So folks might remember that. You know, many uh, many thousands of, of acres or millions of acres even defoliated, if I remember correctly. But um, at any rate, you know, we've been on the eye for uh, had an eye out for it, and uh, we really didn't. You know see that huge uh, flux in, in gypsy moth population around 2010 or 12, you know, when we, we might have expected it. So, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've skipped another decade. So if for whatever reason that uh, particular outbreak was a bust, uh, we're, we're keeping an eye out for it now. And uh, yeah, like I said, we, uh, we have had a lot of sporadic uh, reports of gypsy moth and, and egg masses statewide this year, you know, outside of areas where we know there's usually a resident population that we, uh, we regularly monitor. And so uh, next year will be an interesting year in seeing where we uh, get more uh, more and more reports of caterpillars. So we might be uh, we might be heading for an outbreak. We're not quite sure yet. Which biological control agents are effective at controlling gypsy moths? So uh, for gypsy moth, rely on some natural uh, controls. So there are some uh, some fungi that attack gypsy moth and there's also some viral agents. So uh, yeah, what, what usually causes gypsy moth populations to collapse uh, after an outbreak is that uh, the populations have become so dense that uh, if you get the, the proper climactic conditions, so a lot of this is dependent on on having you know those agents in the right place at the right time and getting the right weather conditions. But when it happens, um, you know, at these super high population densities where, where gypsy moth is basically, you know, uh, touching, you know, each other, these, these viruses and uh, fungi can actually spread rampantly through these uh, populations very fast and cause them to crash. So, uh, yeah, you know, this is, this is one reason we, uh, we think we got so many reports, you know, for things like brown tail and some of these work on, on brown tail or, or similar things work on brown tail moth as well. But uh, yeah, we just didn't really have suitable weather conditions here in 2020. So again, you know, not just a, a crushing an outbreak, you know, it's something that prevents an outbreak from happening. So uh, the lack of the suitable weather conditions to help those uh, control agents kind of spread through the populations here in, in 2020 might, uh, might mean we're going to see more caterpillars than usual in 2021. Next up, what's going on with spruce budworm? I haven't heard anything about it in a while. So that's a great question. So uh, yeah, that's another thing we monitor very closely. And uh, again, that's an insect that uh, has a uh, cyclical outbreak cycle. So the last great outbreak of, uh, of spruce budworm was in the, you know, the mid 1970s, the mid 1980s. So uh, that would really be the, uh, the last time anybody would have heard much about it. Um, but um, yeah, we, we are seeing some increased activity. So we know um, to our north in Canada, there is a, a raging infestation of spruce budworms. So millions and millions of uh, acres defoliated in, in Quebec just north and uh, a good amount of uh, activity in New Brunswick as well, which uh, they're, they're managing uh, pretty actively as well. So, you know, Canada is doing a lot of aerial spraying to control for um, spruce budworm outbreaks going on up there but uh in 2019 we had huge migrations so spruce budworm is, is capable of mass migrations they basically rise up at night into the atmosphere lower atmosphere and just uh, disperse huge distances so we know we had a couple instances of that in 2019 so we saw that in our pheromone trap uh, captures where we caught just huge numbers of uh, of adult moths you know that number really spiked and then um we're just kind of getting to the end of counting those uh, those numbers here in 2020, uh, going into 2021. So we see that those numbers have uh, have dropped, um, fortunately, but they are still high in some places. So really, the area to be on the lookout for spruce budworm is uh, is northern Aroostook County. You know, uh, it seems like they have a uh, a bit of a resident population going um, again. You know, th again, uh, this this is a native insect. It's, it's always there, but. Uh, an elevated resident population, I'll say. And so uh, we did see some some larvae actually 
uh, doing some minor defoliation uh, damage in 2020. So again, 2021 is going to be an interesting year to uh, to see that some patterns for things like gypsy moth and spruce budworm. So, um, what about Asian longhorn beetle? Are you still concerned about it? So yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we know the nearest uh, known infestation is still in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. So that's that's part of the reason that we campaign so uh, so vigorously for for firewood, uh, you know, responsible firewood use, and uh, you know, we we maintain that exterior um, out of state firewood ban. So uh, again, that's a that's a pest that's primed to be moved in um in firewood. So uh, yeah, we continue to uh, to monitor for that. You know, uh, fielding any reports of uh, you know longhorn beetle damage to things like maples and stuff like that. We always follow up on those and um but uh, yeah we're still in a, a major outreach campaign so hopefully some some folks tuning in have seen some of those outreach efforts to, to kind of spread the word about asian longhorn beetle but um at this point in time where we're dealing with plenty of other stuff here in maine and unfortunately we're not dealing with asian longhorn beetle as well <clears throat> all right any questions what invasive insect concerns you the most? Um, if that's a personal question, you know, right now I'm still gonna I'm still gonna say EAB. You know, I spend a lot of time thinking about EAB and and considering you know the the situation in Maine where we still have so much uh, unaffected land area, you know, and so many trees that are unaffected. You know, at a time when uh, you know federal regulations are going away and the uh, the interest in, uh, you know, active management and, uh, you know, regulating of EAB is, is kind of waning a bit. You know, it's been a long, hard fought battle since, you know, over the past 20 years, and, you know, and a lot of other states are, are totally overrun, you know, and speaking from personal experience of things I've seen in other states I've lived and worked, you know, it's, uh, it's a really horrible thing to see the ash wiped uh, from the landscape, you know, in, in such a short amount of time. So uh, that's the one that I, I worry about the most. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's the one for me. More questions. <clears throat> What's the management advice for Northern Aroostook landowners in light of the spruce budworm? So, um, yeah, a lot of that uh, that land up there is uh, is owned by um, you know not not private citizens, but uh, large timber corporations and stuff like that. So uh, my my advice is is for the time being, basically to pay attention to the, the population monitoring and stuff like that, knowing that uh, you know we are building potentially. Um, and uh, yeah, we we did have a spike, but it, it might kind of. Uh, go back and forth, you know, it tends to oscillate from year to year with no clear pattern, even though we, we believe the overall trend is upward. So, um, yeah, pay attention to, uh, to, to the population data coming out and then, uh, yeah, have, have a plan in place, you know, that there's no uh, real need for, for treatment right now, except in some, uh, a few situations, you know, we, we do know there was a, uh, Christmas tree plantation in, in northern uh, Aroostook that did have to treat this year, you know, for whatever reason, the budworm really descended heavily on their uh, Christmas tree plantation. So if you're growing Christmas trees, you know, really be monitoring, you know, carefully right now. If you think you have any issues, you know, reach out, we'll come look and uh, help you look through your, your fields for any sign of budworm and stuff like that. Um, but um, otherwise, yeah, just, uh, just be ready and, uh, you know, if you know other landowners, you know, be talking to them, see what they're planning on doing. Again, if there's a need for uh, large scale spraying operations, you know, those those things are a lot easier when you're not going alone. So. All right. Other questions. <clears throat> can I contact you if I have an issue? Are there local offices I can contact in different parts of Maine? So. Um, to the first question, absolutely. You know, we have a, a full-time, you know, staff here um, in Augusta. That's where we're, the insect and disease lab is based. So most of our activities are based out of there, but uh, we do have technicians and, and field staff in, in all corners of the state. So uh, in addition to us, you know, having statewide responsibilities, you know, I spend a lot of time going up to, you know, Northern Aroostook to, to look at budworm. That's one of my programs and stuff like that, you know, so, you know, we can, we can travel anywhere if there's a need. And uh, if not, you know, we certainly have, um, you know, our field staff that can take a look at stuff and, and we work closely with the other divisions. So, you know, forest rangers are willing to have a look at stuff for us and, and give us intel and uh, also our district foresters. So, uh, yeah, there's a whole network. So basically, wherever you are in Maine, uh, there is there is a way to get uh, answers to your questions and, and 
you know, field visits and stuff like that. What is the caterpillar with toxic hair? So again, that is uh, first and foremost, it's brown tail moth. So uh, that's the one you really have to be concerned about. And then, uh, you know, this, this kind of depends on your, uh, your sensitivity. You know, there are other uh, tussock moths mostly that do have those, those hairs. Um, so if you're a sensitive individual, you know, you know, you get poison ivy really easily, for example, or something like that. Stay away from any hairy caterpillar, you know, gypsy moth can be uh, irritating to some people, you know, things like history, hickory and uh, banded tussock moth, you know, we got a lot of reports uh, from those in certain years, you know, so uh, any, any, any caterpillar with hairs, you know, those hairs aren't just decoration, you know, they're, uh, they're designed to be a, a, a predator deterrent, you know, so irritating to anything that might eat them, but also irritating to, to you. More questions. Here we go. What about firewood? Can I transport it to my camp if I live in Maine? Um, so again, that depends on where you are. So if you live in a regulated area and your camp is outside of a regulated area, then no, the uh, the answer is, is you may not, unless uh, that wood is uh, certified heat treated. So in both regulated areas, there happen to be uh, USDA certified kilns. So if your wood was sourced from there, you'd be okay. But uh, in general, no. So, um, you know, uh, if you can source uh, firewood on your property where your camp is, you know, locally, that's that's the best uh, solution. You know, not only is it coming from the, the surrounding woods, you know, it's free. But um, if you can, you know, purchase and, and use wood locally as possible, um, that's that's really what we are. Uh, are asking of uh, the citizens of Maine to kind of prevent, uh, you know, rapid spreads of, of certain insects. We're doing our best to uh, to control and stuff like that. So uh, if your camp's in an unregulated area, as well as your home, so, you know, most of, of central Maine, you can still uh, transport uh, wood freely. But uh, yeah, just keep in mind as well, you know, a lot of insect damage is, is pretty obvious. So if you have wood in the wood pile, you know, that, uh, that has insect damage visible, um, and some that doesn't, you know, take the stuff that doesn't have the damage because uh, you can unintentionally, you know, introduce stuff into your own uh, woodlot there, wherever your camp is. And then you'll you'll have a problem down the road and, and ruin some of the value and uh, enjoyment of your own property. So, uh, you know, not just risk for, you know, statewide resources, but also that uh, that personal incentive not to uh, not to do anything to you, the trees around your camp. <clears throat> so. All right. One more question, I see. <clears throat> Where can I rewatch these videos? Will you do more? Um, so, yeah, if this was a hit. Uh, I imagine you know this was a pretty fun project. So uh, we can we can certainly try to do more of these if there's a, a demand. And uh, yeah, we have some uh, potential uh, ideas to to make a budworm video uh, in the in the field season. You know, so that's that's one idea. But um, you can rewatch these videos. Yeah, they will be posted um, on our main Forest Service YouTube channel for sure. As far as other locations, I imagine we'll put them up on the website. Um, and uh, yeah, after the uh, the ag trade show uh, is is finished here, I believe it'll all the resources from everything will, will be posted for a certain period of time. So uh, stuff should be able to to be found. If not, you can you can get in touch with me and I'll get it to you directly. But um, if you have any other um, you know issues or, or questions or things you think of later, you can you can reach out to myself or. Uh, Best way is probably to send an email to foresthealth at maine.gov with any additional questions. And then, yeah, keep in mind, you know, I've certainly thrown a, a lot of information at you today, but uh, we have a ton of information that's always there, you know, ready to go through at your uh, convenience. And, and that's all at maineforestservice.gov. So uh, I strongly recommend, you know, any anything that people want to know more about, go check it out at, on our website. So. With that, I thank you for tuning in, and I think that's going to do it for me. So take care, and uh, we'll see you in the upcoming year.
Hello. Please use this attendee guide for tips on how to use the Whova event app to watch conference sessions during the main ag trade show online. In order to use the Whova event app, you must pre-register for access to the mobile or computer app. To register, go to www dot main dot gov forward slash dacf forward slash ag trade show in this example we show you what it looks like when you're using a computer browser and the whova event app in the whova event app you can click on the agenda icon Clicking on that icon allows you to see the full range of conference presentation sessions. You can move back and forth between the different sessions offered each day. When you scroll down, you'll be able to click View Session. Some sessions might not be live just yet, but take a moment to look around and use some of the networking features. The chat and community features allow you to interact with presenters and other attendees. If there's a poll enabled, go ahead and answer it. Click the submit button when you're done. In addition to the agenda icon, you can go to the community icon and find a meetup. These meetups allow you to interact with exhibitors, departmental staff, and service providers, as well as other attendees. You can even suggest your own meetup. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at the show.
Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Robbie Gross, Regional Forest Ranger for the Maine Forest Service up out of Ashland. And welcome uh, to, to attending our presentation in regards to protecting your farmlands timber assets. And joining me is District Ranger Mark Russo out of the Cupsuptic District. And I'll let him introduce himself uh, here in a few minutes. The goal of our presentation today is to walk you through some best practices when you are considering uh, harvesting your property and also giving you some tips to help avoid uh, timber theft, timber trespass related issues. We hope that this is a, uh, a, pretty, a pretty good session for you to, to help give you some thoughts and suggestions as you prepare for timber harvesting. And uh, what we're going to do is we're gonna move through a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, each of us will have opportunities to, to present and hope that you have lots of questions to ask us to, to, to help you uh, moving forward with your property management. Uh, so I'll let Mark introduce himself now. Thank you, Robbie. And uh, thank you all for joining us today, the uh, Maine Ag Trade Show for 2021. And for our presentation today on protecting our farmland timber assets, uh, a little background on myself. Again, my name is Mark Rousseau. I'm a district forest ranger for the Maine Forest Service Division of Forest Protection. Uh, I started with the division back in 1999, working out of the Rangeley District, which is where I currently am today still. Um, I also am a licensed professional consulting forester. I've been licensed and practicing here in the state since 1997. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. And, and just some, some rules of the, the presentation, if you would. Uh, you all have opportunities to ask questions uh, in, in your, your chat feature. So we hope to, to be able to get to those uh, as you ask them. Uh, I think what we would like to do is do our presentation and then in in the midst of, of switching between presentations, there will be opportunities to ask and, and answer questions at that point. And then certainly at the end of the show, we'll have a question answer period to to discuss whatever else may have may have come up. So that being said, I, I think we're ready to to rock and roll and and we'll start with our our presentation. Okay, well, um, I'm gonna start off today's presentation here on protecting your farmlands timber assets. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Again, uh, you know, Robbie covered the expectations and the introductions. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, we'll get started here on the next slide. So we're gonna break it down. Um, as I said, I spent 20 years or more working in the uh, in the main woods and uh, both on the private side and on the uh, public side. And in that time, uh, I spent a lot of time dealing with issues related to timber harvesting. Um, so we'd like to kind of talk about those issues and to try to give you all a, a heads up so that you don't run into those issues yourself uh, when you're planning or you're actually having a harvest on your property. So in my experience, Timber harvesting operations can be broken down into four phases or uh, four stages. There's the planning phase, the implementation phase, the supervision phase, and the closeout. So let's go to the next slide and we'll start with planning. So the old adage about proper planning preventing potential problems. Uh, planning is probably one of the most critical phases of the four phases in harvesting operations because this is where we want to address our problems in the planning phase so that down the road, it doesn't come back and become a worse problem. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll take a look at considering using a forester. The Maine Forest Service highly recommends that anyone, a woodland owner, farmland owner, if you're planning on having a timber harvesting operation, that you utilize the services of a licensed professional forester. Uh, professional foresters work for different people. Some are uh, company foresters that work for large landowners. 
some are consultant foresters that work for private landowners and we have our own state foresters that work with the public. Um, they all offer a range of services. Uh, the private consulting forester can work with a landowner and cover all of the aspects of timber harvest from the planning to the closeout. Um, they have a wealth of knowledge. They have a wealth of connections. Um, they are uh, available uh, to uh, uh, meet whatever needs the landowner may have when it comes to the timber harvesting operations. They do charge a fee. Uh, the, but, uh, you know, what has been the uh, finding is that uh, typically because the consultant foresters are have better access to markets, they, uh, they, they utilize, they do better job of utilizing the forest products, that you tend to get more of an income when you are working with a consultant forester. So the, the, the cost kind of uh, rewards definitely uh, outweigh the costs. Now, a couple of other options available uh, when considering using a forester. Um, some uh, major uh, mills, uh, wood processing facilities and such, they do have foresters on staff that will work with a landowner to uh, have a timber harvesting operation and will cover all the phases from planning to close out. Uh, since they, they are working as a representative of the company, though, that they work for, and in exchange for their services, you know, they require that uh, basically the wood needs to go to their facility. Uh, they need to have that wood, um, but they do work out an arrangement as far as payment goes. It could be an hourly cost or it could just come right out of the stumpage payments. Now, a third option we want you to consider at the very least is the main forest service has a staff of district foresters that are available to come out do a site visit on your property, walk the woodlot with you, and give you some general recommendations about uh, what you should consider and what steps you should take in having a timber harvesting operation. Um, now, their time is limited. Therefore, you know, they, they can't go through as many steps as a consultant would as far as uh, getting your harvesting operation up off the ground. But they are a very valuable resource to have come out, take a walk, um, and point you in the right direction, get you started on the right foot. Um, if you're looking for a, uh, a district forester to come out and, and do a site visit with you, you can find your nearest district forester by going to our main forest service website, go to the main page for the main forest service. You'll be able to find a map uh, of those district foresters and you will find your closest forester and make that contact and start from there. So let's keep going down the planning phase and look at the next slide. So just as important as having a good har a, a forester working with you, it is critical that you have a logger that you find that you can work with. Uh, finding a reputable logger to work on your property uh, will, will that, that's half the battle right there is, is having somebody that you trust and that does a competent job. They are uh, two forms of certification for loggers here in the state of Maine. Uh, there is the Certified Logging Professional Program, and that is a program that is uh, sponsored by uh, the insurance industry. And their goal is to uh, make sure that loggers working in the woodlands have a, uh, a, a good under. Uh, good training in, in safe practices, in uh, utilization, in resource management, um, in, uh, in uh, trying to build a, a safe and professional uh, 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 force of, of uh, loggers working in the woodlands. Um, a second uh, certification that is here in the state of Maine is called the uh, New England Master Logger Certification. And the Master Logger Certification is a third-party certification system that uh, is kind of considered nowadays in the profession of logging as being the gold standard of certification. Uh, in order to become a Master Logger, a, uh, an individual or a, a timber harvesting company um, has to go through a lot of hoops. Um, there's a lot of supervision 
there is uh, a lot of input from the public uh, um, and, and the private sector as to uh, their performance. Um, so those are that you would want to look for in a, in a logger that you would ha have come to work on your property. But no matter ha who you have choose as a logger to come work on your property, you want to make sure you do your homework. You want to make sure you get references. Um, you want to uh, talk to the landowners that they've worked on before to see what their experience was. Um, if possible, you want to go and you want to visit those past harvests to see what the job looked like when they were done. Or even if possible, if the logger is currently working on a harvesting operation, <clears throat> you may want to reach out to that landowner and say, you know, would it be all right if I come and take a look? Uh, but definitely you want to make sure that you, uh, you put the time into finding a qualified and reputable logger. To, uh, to work on your harvesting operation. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the next slide here. Having a contract, it's not required by law, but again, the Maine Forest Service highly recommends that you have a contract or what's sometimes called a timber sale agreement between yourself and the logger. Now this timber sale agreement spells out who is responsible for doing what. Uh, it determines, you know, which trees will be cut, what you're going to be paid for those trees, when you're going to be paid for those trees, and things like what will my woodlot look like when it's done. Um, you can specify uh, when the contract, when the program begins, when the harvest ends. You can put in stipulations that protect you and your property in the event of uh, Unseasonable weather. Let's say uh, we don't want to have a logger working in the mud season that could possibly damage your property long term. So by writing that into your contract, that allows you to be able to, to stop harvesting operations if it is a detriment to your property. So it's very important that, that you have a good solid harvesting contract uh, before you start working uh, on a timber harvest. And if you're working with a consultant forester, a consultant forester will more often than not, already have a contract kind of boilerplated that they can use and can customize to your needs uh, for that harvesting operation. Um, also, many master loggers have a contract that they can work with you to, uh, to specify your needs and their needs. Just make sure that both parties are being served because you know the, the, the great thing about having a contract is that it does protect both parties. So let's go ahead on to the next slide. And we'll talk about workers' compensation and landowner liability. Um, you may not realize this, but you as a landowner might be liable for workers' compensation costs if your logger or one of their loggers' employees is injured on your property while conducting a timber harvest. So it's very important that you make sure you take the proper steps to protect yourself from that liability. And in that law, and the uh, the link you see on the bottom there, um, is the link to that full law. Um, all of the links that you're seeing posted here in my presentation, if you go to the uh, Hoover webs, the uh, Hoover site, and you look up my profile, I have all these links listed on my uh, my profile. Also, all of these links you can find by going to the main link for the main forest service. If you go there, all of that information is in here. So let's keep going on to the next slide and talk about workers' compensation and again. So there's three options of a, uh, to avoid liability for workers' compensation. One is make sure that the logger that's going to be working on your property can show you proof that they have workers' compensation insurance. Now, if he's an independent, he or she is an independent contractor, they may not have proof of workers' compensation insurance, but what they should show you instead of that is proof that they have a certificate of independent contractor status. Okay, And that is uh, a certificate that they have to obtain from the main workers' compensation board, which basically states that they're an independent contractor, they work for themselves, they don't work for the landowner. So that would be your second option is to make sure that they can show you that proof of independent contractor status. Now, the third option, uh, you yourself as the landowner would have to go to the workers' compensation board and request a, a certificate of independent contractor status on behalf of the logger. Um, you, as part of that, in order for you to obtain that proof, you would probably 
off, also have to have a written contract that specifies that the logger is an independent contractor. But make sure before you have anybody working on your property uh, that they can show you either they have compensate workers' compensation proof or they're an independent contractor. Otherwise, as we said, you could be liable if they get hurt. So let's keep going here with planning. So as part of the planning process, you want to make sure you put a, a fair amount of time into what we call the timber harvest layout. And that is making sure before anybody steps onto the property that you know where your boundary lines are and that your boundary lines are properly marked. And also you want to make sure that you spend the time to walk your woodlot with your harvester so that they know where the property lines are. Also, you want to identify where the specific harvest area is. Maybe there's just one section of your farm or your woodlot that you want them to cut on and you don't want them to go into another section. Well, you want to make sure that you're able to identify that beforehand and be able to mark that with flagging or some other temporary means. Some other things you want to consider before you get started. Are there any resource protection areas where you might be working in? Uh, they could be shoreland areas. Uh, they could be specific water crossings. Uh, are you working, if your property is in an unorganized township, you have to consider what land use planning commission zone you might be working in because there are some zones which require either a specific permit for timber harvesting activities from the land use planning commission or totally prohibit timber harvesting. You also wanna consider if you're in an organized town, are there any municipal zoning ordinances that regulate or prohibit timber harvesting operations? And you also want to identify and mark areas such as where's the log landing going to be? Where are the skids trails going to be? Laying this all out ahead of time and having a clear understanding with you and the harvester saves you a lot of hassle down the road. So let's keep going to the next slide. So now we're kind of getting into the implementation phase. As part of the implementation phase, we need to consider filing a forestry operations notification. And here we'll talk about what it is, who fills it out, why is it necessary, how is it used. So let's go ahead to the next slide. So a forestry operations notification, or what we call a FON, is required by the state of Maine, Maine Forest Service, prior to conducting a timber harvest. Now, it has to be completed either by the landowner or the landowner's designated agent. Now you would ask, what is a designated agent? Well, a designated agent is a person that the landowner determines or designates to be their representative in all aspects involved with the timber harvesting operation, such as the paperwork. When filing a harvest notification, the landowner can designate that responsibility uh, to, the, to the designated agent. So a harvest notification is required it is required that all parties involved with the harvest notification, with the harvest, need to file, uh, need to sign that FON. So you, the landowner, at the very least, need to sign it. If you have a harvester, that harvester needs to sign it. And also, a designated agent needs to sign it. And your forester, if you have a forester, they need to sign it. So um, the why behind, why does the state require a harvesting operation? Well, it does couple of things for the state and for your benefit as well. It provides a notification to the state of your intent to have a timber harvesting operation. That notification, once it's completed and approved, goes to the main forest service and it goes out to the field forest rangers. And it provides the rangers notification that, hey, there's a timber harvesting going to happen at this location at this date. So that allows them, if they're driving down the road, to see that harvest and to know, okay, that harvest has been approved. Um, it has a notification on it. They'll stop in. They'll do a, 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 a just a, a, an inspection to make sure that that all all the regulations and 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 uh, are being met. And also, you know, if they if they see any areas where it might be a concern, they'll point that out to the to the logger. They'll point that out to the landowner. So really, it provides a record for us to know who is cutting what, when, where, and how. Whereas if we didn't have that notification, 
somebody is cutting, we see a, 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 a harvest going on, we stop and say, well, there's no harvest notification here. Why is that? So it, it helps us to, to prevent unlawful cutting of trees or, 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 or damages to a, a landowner, theft, those types of issues. Um, the notification also goes to, if it's an organized town, it goes to the town CEO. If it's in an unorganized town, it goes to the Land Use Planning Commission uh, for their aware, situational awareness. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So the forestry operations notification has been in place for 30 years or more, and it has always been a paper-based uh, uh, notification system. You fill it out on paper, you send it in by the mail, it goes into the main forest service, the main forest service records it and approves it. Um, and that notification gets mailed back to the landowner and the landowner receives a notification number. Well, that process has changed as of January 1st of this year. We have taken the forestry operations notification to an online system, which we are calling Forest or the Forest Online Resource Tool. Uh, it is the same notification and asks the same basic questions as far as who is involved with it, what their contact information is and such. Uh, but now it's all being completed online. And uh, uh, in order for someone to complete a uh, online forest notification, they need to have, they need to start an email account, or not an email account, but they need to start an account with the main forest service, which means you need to have an email, obviously. Um, but uh, and each individual, the harvester, if you have a designated agent, if you have a, uh, a forester involved, each one of those individuals would need to go in and create their own account so that they can all uh, enter their information into it as, as well as electronically sign that form. So the uh, current system of, that we have, the old paper system, will be in place up until April 1st of this year, at which time the uh, plan is to stop taking paper notifications and require that all new forestry operation notifications be completed through the forest resource tool online system. Now, in order to uh, complete, in order to find the, uh, the online link, if you just go to the main forest service webpage, the main page there, there is a quick link right there that'll take you to uh, the forestry operations notification application page. And it is very good. It's, it, there, it's very self-explanatory. There's also several uh, tutorial sessions that you can click on to and you can watch. Uh, and you can even do some practice uh, to fill out a forestry operations notification. The paper forms will be accepted, as I said, will be accepted until April 1st. And if you were looking for a copy of a paper fund, you can get those at most of your town offices. Um, and any one of, of your main forest service uh, offices would have one of those as well. And if you're looking for a main forest service office, just go to the main forest service webpage there and uh, look under the Division of Forest Protection and that'll, that'll show you where all of our offices are located. Um, let's go ahead, go on to the next slide here. So we're still under uh, implementing implementation here, okay? Um, some considerations about the fund still, the forest wrappers notification, okay? Once that notification is sent into the state and it is approved, the state will give you a specific number called a, a forest operations notification number. That number needs to be posted on the landing of the timber harvesting operation or if you uh, have a private road that goes from the public road into your property, that, that notification number can be posted at the entrance to that private road on your property. But the notification does need to be posted, um, and it just needs to have a number. Uh, if you just want to, I've seen it done before, if you just want to paint the number on a tree, as long as it's clearly visible, that is completely acceptable. Because again, we use that number to determine Okay, who's, who's working here? Whose property is it on? Uh, how big is this harvest? Are there gonna be any clear cuts? Are there any water crossings? Are they working near any shoreland zoning uh, or shoreland areas? So um, it's, that number provides us with a lot of information. 
The other great thing that the harvest notification does, that that forest wrapper notification does, is because that number is specific to your timber harvesting operation, that number stays with the wood that comes off of your property. So when the trucker hauler comes, picks up that wood from your property, that trucker has to fill out what's called a trip ticket. And as part of that trip ticket, that harvest notification is written on that trip ticket. When that wood goes to the processing facility, it goes and it gets scaled. When it gets scaled, that trip ticket becomes part of that record and that harvest notification becomes part of that record. So that when that wood goes to the mill and that wood gets paid for, that number stays with that wood. So it allows us to follow what's kind of a chain of custody. So that in the event that there is an issue down the road, um, landowners say, you know, I don't think I got paid for all the wood that was taken off of my property. That number allows us to track that wood from your property to the mill. So that that chain of custody is, is critically important for us. Uh, without having that number, there would be no way for us to be able to follow where that wood went and to be able to, uh, to get restitution for a landowner uh, when it's necessary. The harvest notification, the fawn notification is valid for two years. So from the time you file that notification, you have two years to complete that harvest or to renew your notification number or to get a new notification number. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So let's move into supervision. This is step three. So these are things that what should you as a landowner or your designated agent or your forester or what be, what types of things should they be looking out for while the harvest operation is, is active and going? Well, certainly if you have a timber sale agreement or a timber sale contract, you want to make sure that the contractor is abiding by the terms of that contract. We'll talk about some other uh, things that we want to look for. Let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about timber harvest regulations. So the things you want to be looking out for for timber harvest regulations, and these are the same things that we as forest rangers, when we do a compliance inspection on your property, on your timber harvest, these are the types of things that we're looking at. We're looking at things such as the Forest Practices Act. Now the Forest Practices Act regulates clear cuts of 20 acres or more. Uh, if you as a landowner own more than a hundred acres statewide and you have a clear cut of 20 acres or more, then you have to comply with the, with, the, with the regulations as outlined in the Forest Practices Act. Now, I wish we had more time to cover each one of these because I'll tell you, each subject here alone is worth worthy of an hour or more discussion. Um, so, But right now, we're just trying to bring these things to light so that you are aware that they are out there. If you want more information on any of these uh, regulations that I'm covering here today, Go to the main Forest Service website and you can you can you can work your way through that and you can find all of the information on all of the regulations that we're talking about here today. So another thing to consider is the liquidation harvesting rule. Now the liquidation harvesting rule, again, if you own less than 100 acres statewide, then you are exempt from the liquidation harvesting rule. If you own more than 100 acres statewide, and you are cutting on a parcel of 20 acres or more, then you fall under the rule, the, the, the specification, the regulations of the liquidation harvesting rule. And again, there's a lot there. So it's very important that if you fall into this category, that you look this, look up the liquidation harvesting rule and make sure that you are in compliance with it. Now, slash laws. Slash laws applies to timber harvesting throughout the entire state, and it doesn't matter the size of the harvest uh, uh, or when you bought the property. And we talk about slash. When we talk about slash, slash is the byproduct of the timber harvesting operation. Slash is the branches that the logger cuts off or the tops that the logger cuts off. And any other residual uh, trees that may get knocked over or brushed, that's what we're considering slash. Now, slash laws apply. Uh, within 50 feet of a public right highway, within 50 feet of the shoulder of that public highway, you can't. There can be no slash left behind. Within 25 feet of property lines, uh, utility right of ways, or railroad right of ways, 
uh, there can be no slash left behind. And within 100 feet of occupied dwellings, there can be no slash left behind. Now, the slash laws are fire prevention laws. Um, the reason behind the slash laws is we want to take every, every possible uh, availability to us to limit or prevent the spread of wildfire here in the state of Maine. And by making sure that slash is not left within 50 feet of a, of a public highway, uh, that's a fire prevention law because we're trying to remove the possible fuel from a possible heat source, with the heat source being the public highway. Now, uh, slash long property lines, we're trying to create what we would call a defensible space, is, is that we want to try to create a barrier such that if a fire burns through or starts on one property, there might be something there to prevent it from moving on to another property. So that is the reason behind the slash laws, is they are fire prevention laws. So let's take a look at the next slide under uh, supervision here. Water quality standards. So. We have to take particular care when we're working near water quality, when working near streams. And we talk about water quality standards. We're generally talking about areas adjacent to, um, in the areas adjacent to all streams and most of your ponds and wetlands, their shoreline integrity must be protected. We need to maintain adequate shading on the water, on the waters. We need to make sure that we're not disturbing any of the, the banks uh, or the shoreline areas. You are also talking about areas within 75 feet of streams that will drain between 300 acres and 25 square miles. And the other areas we're looking at is within 250 feet of many lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, and non-forested wetlands. So water quality regulations um, is something that we pay particular attention to. And um, the, the general rule of thumb and, and, and the understanding is all water flows somewhere. And if as a result of your timber harvesting operation, if there's any soil movement or sedimentation or siltation into that water body, then the chances are pretty good that you may be uh, violating one or, one or more water quality regulations. So anytime you're working logging, in close proximity to water, need to take very particular uh, uh, steps to prevent any erosion or sedimentation into, into that water body. So let's keep going down here to supervision. So as part of you know, your supervision process, you wanna make sure, are you being paid, obviously, and are you being paid in a timely manner? Now, there is a law, and uh, we refer to it as the 45 day rule. And what that law specifies is that unless you have a uh, otherwise agreement written in writing into a contract, the law states that the timber harvester is required to pay the landowner in full within 45 days of delivering the harvested forest products to a processing facility. So from the time that the uh, the logger or the, the trucker hauls that wood to the processing facility, that logger gets paid, that logger has 45 days to turn around and pay you your, your payment for that, for that wood. Also, for that load of wood, as well as being paid, the logger is required to provide you with a copy of what we call a wood measurement sheet, uh, which, uh, We'll go to the next slide and, and we'll go through the wood measurement sheets. So as I said, in addition to the payment, for each load of wood that goes to a mill or to a processing facility, the logger is required to provide the landowner a measurement tally sheet. And that tally sheet needs to specify who the landowner is, who the logger or the contractor is that cut it, who the trucker or the hauler was that hauled that wood, what type of forest product it was, whether it be pulp wood, uh, saw logs, firewood, the date that that wood was hauled to that processing facility and where that processing facility that is, that is being hauled to. So this, this is a record that you as a landowner need to hold on to and you need to keep. And we'll talk about why it's so important that you do that. So let's go to the next uh, slide, please. 
So moving into the closeout phase, things to be considering, which even before we get to the closeout phase, you certainly want to consider, but how is my woodlot going to look when we're done? When that logger is gone, you know, what will it look like? Well, certainly that should be specified in your timber sales agreement. But things you want, you want to consider about is um, cleaning up and stabilizing your woodlot. Uh, you want to make sure that when that logger is gone, that uh, those roads, those skid trails that were used will remain in place and be available to you. So you want to think about things like uh, seeding bare ground, uh, seeding the landing area, bringing up some grass for uh, for potential feed and habitat. You want to think about things about stabilizing the, the skitter trails, um, particularly if they are on any type of a slope. You want to think about putting in water bars so that, that you don't get that erosion uh, later on after the harvest is gone. Um, so these are the types of things that close out that you want to consider making sure that your property is solid, that is safe, that is acceptable to you for use further down the road. And you also want to think about reporting, end of year reporting. Uh, some things to consider is the, uh, the main forest service and owner annual landowner report, which will be coming your way once you file the harvest notification. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So another thing to consider is uh, you want to make, make sure you maintain all of your harvesting records uh, to make sure that if you are enrolled in the tree growth tax program, you want to make sure you keep those records as proof that you are abiding by the guidelines of that tree growth tax program. And also, you want to make sure you maintain all those records because both the uh, federal and state income tax laws require any income received as a result of a timber harvesting operation needs to report it as taxable income. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, there we are. So uh, the Maine Forest Service Annual Landowner Report Form. This form uh, is required to be filled out by the landowner or the designated agent uh, after the on an, on an annual basis, on a yearly basis. So when you file your harvest notification to the state, that automatically, that notification and that number and all that information automatically puts you into a database for the annual landowner report form. So that uh, in December of each year, as long as your harvest notification is still valid, that landowner annual report form will be automatically sent, mailed to you for you to fill out. And the questions that it asks is, you know, they want to know uh, how much basically how much wood came off of your woodlot, where it went, what products were you sold uh, and such. Did you utilize a, a, a logger? Did you utilize a forester? Um, and this is all information that is required that it be filled out and sent back before January 31st of the year. And this information is all good data that the main forest uses to to gauge the uh, the forest products economy in the state for that year. Um, also, the information is used to determine the county tree growth tax valuation for that year. Uh, so this, be prepared that if you file a harvest notification, then come December, you should see in your mail, or now that we are going to the online system, you should see in your email, a, uh, a main forest service annual landowner report form. And if you have any questions about how to fill it out, there is a contact number in there for you to call and you can get direction on how to fill those out, get some help on that. So let's go right ahead, keep going. So, so some very important resources for you. If at any time you're considering having a timber harvesting operation, the uh, link on the top there on, on that page is the link to the Maine Forest Service main webpage. And there is a wealth of information in there for you to, to look at. Uh, the other link there is a link to the, uh, uh, the main forest service, uh, basically the handbook of, forest, uh, of timber harvesting laws for the state of Maine. Um, all of the laws and regulations, which I talked about in my presentation, you can find in that handbook. Uh, as well as a wealth of other information that if if you're a landowner, and even if you're not planning on having a harvesting operation, I would highly recommend 
that you download a copy of that book. Uh, and if you go to that link, that is the link to the PDF version of that handbook because there is just a wealth of information and even uh, uh, more uh, direction that you can follow to get even more information on that. Um, it is available in the PDF form. Um, I think we do still have uh, some of the actual handbooks on hand that if you go to your contact your local forest ranger or your local uh, district forester, they'd be able to get a hold of, get a copy of that for you. So really, we cover a lot of information in a very short time. And, and I, as I said, any one of the subjects that I covered, we could easily spend hours discussing on. But really, we just want to make sure that you are aware that, that you know, the things that you should be considering prior to having a harvesting operation be, so that you, you go down that road, you say, oh, gee, I didn't think about that. Well, we want to make sure because having a timber harvesting operation on your property is a very significant endeavor. So that would conclude my portion of the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be more than willing to try to answer them if I can. Leaning trees considered slash. Uh, no, no, slash is is uh, has to be in contact with the ground. So an actual leaning tree would not be considered slash. Is there someone who can help a landowner to fill out the new web-based fawn? Uh, yeah, there are a couple of options. As I said, um, if you go on to the Maine Forest website, there is a, uh, there is a tutorial session. Uh, there is even a YouTube session that uh, goes through each section of the harvest notification and how to fill it out online. Um, if after that, if it's still not helped, there is a, uh, an actual phone number. You can call and ask, talk to a, a real person. Uh, that will talk you through the process of filling out the web-based spawn. This worker comp stuff seems tricky for a landowner. True. If I use a consulting forester, will they take care of administering the timber sale? Absolutely. Um, that is uh, the, for the consulting forester's responsibility is to ensure that the, uh, the logger that they or is working for you complies with all state laws. And I just uh, pointed out to me here, um, for getting help with the forestry operation notifications online, you can call the main forest service at 287 2791. Okay. Well, we will have another uh, chance after Robbie does his presentation for folks to present questions. But right now, I'm going to hand it back over to uh, uh, Regional Ranger Robbie Gross. Uh, thanks, Mark. Great, great job with lining out the step by step process. Uh, for a timber harvest. Moving forward, what I'm gonna focus on is uh, direct information on property lines, uh, posting your property and, and what you can do to, to make that legit. Also focusing on uh, timber theft, timber trespass, what we can do to help you with those types of situations and how most importantly, uh, you can you know protect yourself to begin with, but then uh, collect damages if something bad does happen. So uh, we'll move right into the slideshow. And first thing we wanna talk about are property boundary lines. So it, it really is essential to make sure that your property lines are, are maintained, marked and, and noticeable. Really that, that's one of the number one things that you can do for protecting your property. Oftentimes when we uh, receive a complaint, uh, hear from a landowner, uh, you know, a lot of times boundary lines aren't always marked as well as they could be if, if, if they're marked at all. So we really, really wanna highlight that. 
it's not uncommon to find property without evidence boundaries. That really puts us in a, in a quandary when we're called. If, if there's no physical evidence on the ground, uh, it makes it real, real tough to, to, to move forward without having a, a survey completed uh, to, to really determine whose property is whose. Uh, property lines can be seen in many ways. Uh, the most common, obviously, are blazes uh, based on a survey, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But one can also have just survey pins out on corners of properties, uh, sign posts. Uh, and traditionally along a lot of farmland, we often see a lot of rock walls and fences. Now we all know that sometimes those boundaries can, can change over time, property ownership can change, so on and so forth. So it's not always 100% uh, relevant that just because there's a rock wall there means there's a property line, but they are indicators of, of where uh, lines have, have been in the past for sure. And certainly signage. Uh, which we'll talk about here in a little bit too. Uh, but signs work very, very well to indicate where property lines are. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So, so really the, the best way to, to, to really delineate your property line is to hire a surveyor. If you're thinking about having your property harvested, you know, being able to have a nice blaze surveyed line really means uh, a great deal, not only to you, to your abutting landowner, to the harvester, uh, everybody involved. Uh, not to mention, you know, sometimes what we'll hear is it, it costs a lot to have your property surveyed. It, it's a, you know, it's a huge commitment and, and that is true. But the other thing that we would say is by having it done, uh, you increase your property's value and, and you really do all you can to protect yourself from, from you know, people that may want to uh, cross, uh, take timber, so on and so forth. Uh, you see that link, and, and as Mark said, any of the links that we show here, uh, the links are in our profiles in the Whova uh, app. So don't hesitate to go there and, and grab those. That link I have there uh, basically brings you to a a list of surveyors across the state of Maine. There's a, a world of knowledge, a, a, a wealth of, of people out there willing to help to, to survey your property. So take advantage of that. And know this too, that when you have a full survey done, those surveys are registered with the county deeds office. They're an official document uh, for, for your property ownership. Uh, next slide, please. The, the one thing that we want you to avoid is using tax maps to delineate what your property lines are. Uh, oftentimes we'll get a call from a landowner uh, concerned about their property and, and they're referencing a tax map or they show us a tax map when we ask if their property is surveyed. Tax maps are not, are, are not surveys. They're basically a depiction of what your property is uh, being taxed for essentially within a community or a town city. So while while it may be that the the depiction is close to what your property actually is, there really is no direct correlation between the tax map and a boundary line out in the field. Next slide, please. So what can you do? Uh, as Mark said earlier, it is your responsibility if you're a landowner and having uh, your property harvested, if you are going to harvest within 200 feet of your property line, you need to have it marked. Now, what does what does marked mean? Well, marked certainly can be the surveyed blazes, uh, but it can be flagged, uh, boundaries if you would. Uh, it just needs to be visible. So if you're going to harvest near your property, uh, or if the abutting landowner to your property is harvesting, uh, within 200 feet, that property needs to be marked in some form or manner. Uh, in regards to line trees, uh, it's kind of a misnomer. Some folks feel that, well, half the, half the boundary is mine and half the boundary is yours because it splits uh, our two properties. And, and the reality of it is, by, by law, if a line tree is harvested, you need the abutting landowner's permission to do so. 
So which, which kind of leads me into a, a point that I make below in this slide is communicating with your adjacent property owners is, is huge. It, it really is. And oftentimes what we find is property owners don't like talking to one another sometimes. And, and if, if we would just take an opportunity to go knock on the door, go, go have a, just a very informal, you know, friendly conversation with, with your abutting landowner, it would solve a lot of problems. Uh, with the reblazed uh, line aspect that I talk about here, it, you know, blazes are going to fade over time. Uh, paint's going to fade. The scars made on a tree for the blaze are going to fade, grow over to, to some extent. So keep it maintained. You know, you spent the, the money to begin with to have your property surveyed. So Keep, keep those things uh, updated if you would. Keep your property line brushed out. It, it doesn't take long for a particular line to, to accumulate with brush. So take some time and, and get out there and, and, uh, or hire somebody for that matter to, to keep your property maintained. Um, it, you know, my, my last point, have someone look out for your property if you're not around. If you're gonna spend a significant time uh, in the warmer climate, in the winter time, you know, have somebody pay attention. Uh, continue that networking, if you would, uh, to, to, to protect your property. Just going to talk about posting real quick. Uh, it's not our recommendation at all for you to post your property. Uh, and, and I want to stress that. It's, it's all up to you. Uh, but if you decide that you want to post your property because you're having problems with people coming over onto your property, make sure you put the appropriate amount of signs up uh, every 100 feet. Make sure you're hitting all the vehicle access points uh, from, the, from the highway, so on and so forth. And uh, I kind of skipped ahead. Uh, we can go next on the slide. And, and make sure uh, that, that you just post it real well. Uh, every hundred feet again and every access point. And the thing that people forget, sometimes my last point there, a landowner can verbally or in writing communicate to a person that they're not welcome. So you don't need to post your property to, to tell somebody, hey, you're not welcome onto my property. And if you delineate that for a person, that, that is sufficient by law. I'm gonna talk real quick about the purple paint law. Many of you uh, have, have heard about that. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, essentially it's OSHA safety purple uh, paint. You can get that at any hardware store. But here in Maine, if, if we see uh, an eight inch stripe vertically on a particular tree, what that means is access by permission only. So uh, in lieu of signage, you can use the purple paint. And we see that more and more down in Southern Maine. Uh, me being up in Northern Maine, I don't see it quite as much, but but it is there. What do we call, what do we, what do we consider timber theft? Essentially it's a malicious intent to deprive a property owner of timber or the value thereof. So Mark talked about the 45 day law, uh, you know, based on intent, we can uh, sometimes uh, look at that as being timber theft. If a timber uh, harvester or contractor had no uh, intent to, to pay you as a, a landowner. And certainly, uh, you know, cutting trees directly on someone's property without permission, uh, that, that in itself, uh, you know, is a pretty blatant uh, act, if you would. And uh, if we can prove intent, we will look at that as, as timber theft. Next slide. Next slide, please. And so Mark talked about trip ticket scale slips and stumpage records. I just want to focus you on the title and sections down below, um, wood measurement rules. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but know this, we would rather hear from you right up front if you're not being paid properly, or if you're not getting scale slips and trip tickets and stumpage records uh, in a timely manner, we wanna hear from you. Uh, we can help you navigate through the process rather than waiting three years from, from a point that you didn't recover something. We'd rather hear from you right up front. Um, and, and really it's, it's one of those issues that 
we have most problems with because folks aren't real familiar with what, what the law says. But that being said, every time a wood harvester contractor delivers you a check for stumpage on your property, there should be scale slips and stumpage records attached with that check. If there are not, ask for them. And if the, the harvester or contractor cannot provide those, tell them that it's their responsibility to do that. And if you struggle uh, getting that info, call us. Next slide, please. Timber trespass. We kind of differentiate trespass with if you're harvesting a piece of property and someone just, it crosses a boundary uh, accidentally. You know, we can look at accidentally, intentfully, uh, a, number, a number of different ways. But uh, generally, this is more a civil violation where uh, the intent isn't such that they were trying to do something wrong. Um, it's, it's, it's more an instance where it happened. And again, we can, we can help with that. Next slide, please. Criminal trespass. I, and I put this in here just for the fact that, you know, going back to the posting of property, if someone does come onto your property, um, after it's posted, after you've told them not to enter the property, that is considered criminal trespass. And uh, I put it in here just to note that. And again, any law enforcement officer here in the state of Maine can, can deal with that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is common. And it's one of the bigger issues that we deal with uh, in spring and fall seasons. Uh, no one wants to see their fields or land roads rutted up. Uh, sometimes it's it's an individual just looking for a good time. Sometimes it's, it's done accidentally. Sometimes it's intentful. Regardless, if someone operates a vehicle on land of another and destroys your crops or forest products, uh, there's a means to help collect damage and restitution to have this fixed. So don't forget that. Um, we see it a lot across the state. And, and it's really one of the issues that causes uh, property to be posted uh, to begin with. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk just real quick about criminal, criminal versus civil and restitution. So really, you heard me say it's all about the intent. If, if we have a repeat uh, offender out there that continually violates the law or creates problems with you as a landowner, we're going to start looking at that as more criminal intent than, than just, you know, mistakes. So we, we take a look at that. Uh, restitution can be collected via charges being brought forward. So that it's the mechanism for us to be able to help you collect damages if something is done, whether your property is harvested without permission or whether your field is rutted or whether there's any other damage that's been created. Uh, don't don't forget about that. We will we will write a summons and and help uh, through the court system try to collect damages. Surveying costs. If your property is not surveyed to you know up front, then then if you do have it surveyed, if we think or you think that the timber has been harvested on your property without permission, we're going to ask you to do a survey. It's the only way that we can really see whether property was harvested illegally, not, illegally or not. But that being said, uh, we can help recover those surveying costs in court. And none of this prohibits you from collecting damages through a civil action uh, you know, beyond what we may be able to help you with in, in you know, district court. So keep that in mind. You can certainly do those things um, above and beyond what we can help with. And if you prefer to try to do an out of court settlement with a particular uh, a harvester or adjacent landowner, that, that's your right to. And as Maine Forest Rangers come and, and answer your uh, complaint or questions, we're going to advise you of that. Next, next slide. So violation resolution. Simply put, call, call Maine Forest Rangers at any of the DPS communication sites in Augusta, Bangor, or Holton. I've got 911 here, but certainly there's the, the non-911 uh, phone numbers as well. Uh, those communication centers would welcome that. 
and you can contact any Forest Ranger office uh, at those links as well. So don't hesitate to call. We would much rather be proactive than reactive. And that even if it's a question, uh, I know for me, if, if someone uh, calls and asks uh, questions about a particular timber harvest or about how to protect themselves, I would rather come out and have that interaction up front than, than you know, later. Next slide, and, and I, think that's, I think that's it. And does anyone have any questions? And I'll apologize uh, right up front. I, I rushed through that a little bit, but as you all know, we have a time frame. So was there a rule about two silver stripes on boundary for, for no trespassing? So I think, you know, before our rule came out a few years ago with the purple paint, you know, there was some different language out there that, that you could do uh, different things with, with silver paint. Um, there's a variety of, of historical uh, language and, and laws that, that have come to be. But that being said, uh, the purple paint law is what's valid now, not, not the two silver stripes. Next question, is there anything a landowner can do if a neighbor damages their privately owned road? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a matter again of communicating with the landowner up front. But if, if uh, your, your road going into your property is damaged, uh, certainly reach out to us and we can see what we can do to, to help you out. And I would also recommend talking to your landowner, uh, your abutting landowner and neighbor. That's hugely, hugely important. And sometimes some of these large issues that we run into can be can be mitigated just by a simple conversation. Uh, I see a question here. Can every other tree uh, be cut along a boundary line? And and uh, like I had said earlier, any any sort of line tree or boundary line tree that is harvested needs to have the abutters written permission for you to do that. That, that is essential. You can't just make the assumption that that tree is, is mine and then the next one is your neighbor's uh, for the simple reason that if, if there's some high quality wood along that line and you decide to take every other tree and you, you kind of high grade it and leave the lower quality trees there, um, you know, that's problematic. So you need to get the abutters permission before you cut line trees. And it looks like uh, that's, that's all for, for questions. It's all the time that we have. And I, I just wanna thank all of you for attending. Uh, this was a quick presentation, like Mark stated earlier, there's a lot of information here and we would love to meet you out on your property. To, to help you out uh, at, at any time. We have forest rangers across the state. So, so please call us. Uh, we would really rather meet up with you up front than, than before a problem uh, or, or after a problem has been created. So that, that's all for me. And Mark, I'll, I'll leave you just a couple thoughts. Yes, thank you all for attending. As I said, I wish we had more time. There's a lot of stuff to cover there. But please do follow up on those links. And, uh, and, and if you have any questions, as Robbie said, reach out to a forest ranger or one of the district forest service people. And uh, we're here to help you. Thank you all. Everybody have a good day.